Hello gang, this is Edgar Wright speaking, director and co-writer of the screenplay of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. This is Michael Bacall, co-writer of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and Sickly, Mexican Orphan number three. Uh, this is Brian Lee O'Malley, cartoonist, creator. Not so creator? Oh, you trumped us. <laughs> you pulled out the trump card. I did. You, that was such a power move. So early in the thing, thinking, yeah, you directed it. You co-wrote the screenplay. I, I, I drew this thing. I win. <laughs> yeah, Brian Lee O'Malley wins immediately. Let's just go home. Really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we. Um, How old are you now, Scott? Like. 20? Well, this is a. Well, let's talk a little bit about like um one one of the one of the great things about making this film. Was that Brian? Like a lot of the artwork came from your photographic reference, so we had an amazing kind of uh, thank you, thank you. gift of all this uh, photographic, yeah. you know, material that you'd done of these real, like suburban streets in Toronto. And this was your the shot you just saw right at the start with the kind of the snow was was a street you used to live on, right? Yeah, it was the other end of uh, I guess it's Marchmount Road. In Don't Toronto. give it away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they'll never know which end. Okay, they won't know which end. <laughs> uh, but they'll go on a Scott Pilgrim tour. They'll find it for for themselves. Um, but yeah, even the interiors. I had some photos and stuff of my friends' apartments, and this is like all heavily based on that. I went. Re- me and Marcus Rowlands, the production designer, went round to your old apartment. Yeah. And you still know the people who live there, right? Yeah. 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 Promise to be good. Of course, I'll be good. Seriously, please be good. But that's uh, that's one of the things that was like, uh, I mean, it was it was amazing, kind of like it, it, making this film because I and I know a lot of the actors felt this way is that we ended up kind of literally living in a Toronto snow globe. It just felt like we were in a bubble making this film, <laughs> and especially by the fact that the locations were so real, um, you know, that we could stand on those streets and uh, you know once you pump them full of like fake snow, it felt very magical. Did. Yeah, it was it was very weird to go back to my old neighborhood during a film shoot, and uh, yeah, that was that was very that was very strange and exciting. Do you think the owners of the places had any idea what was really going on? I don't know. I I kind of hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel, I always feel kind of responsible after doing Spaced and giving away the um, address of the Spaced House, mm. and thereby <laughs> plaguing that owner with fans okay, every Saturday that? afternoon for the rest oh, of her life. Yeah. Now there's a lot of there's a lot of details of we got Brian we got you to do a lot of the um, we bothered you a lot during the production would that be fair? That I think that would be fair. Would yeah. also be fair to say we bothered you in pre-production. <laughs> and You've been bothering me for years and years now. Like the Brian Lee O'Malley is the anti Alan Moore in terms of you can you can un- <laughs> unfortunately for him always get hold of him. You can bother me all you want, yeah. But yeah, maybe maybe the next time somebody does an adaptation, you'll turn into JD Salinger and just be off radio. I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> but even like the uh, one of the things that we got Brian to do was we did a lot of um, we got we got you to do a lot of artwork on you know things that you'd drawn in the books like that cat mug, and what else is there in that first scene that was 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 your drawings. Uh, I'm not sure there's anything else in the first scene, but I did a lot of the sort of the t-shirts that Scott wears and things like that. But did them life size essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's there's a lot of stuff that I completely forgot until I started watching the film. Now this title sequence here, which is done by the amazing people at Shinola, is the start of um, a numerically obsessed film. Uh, I really wanted this to be like um, have a have a kind of Sesame Street feel to Scott Pilgrim and. <laughs> Like uh, the no- the letter X is very important, and then also have a number ranking throughout the film. So there are, and actually within this title sequence, every time you see one of the actors' names, you have the the X's and numbers. Yeah, they each kind of have a like an iconic representation in this thing. I love this the opening credits. It's like it's my favorite part of the film. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the bit when it says "based on the books by Brian Lee O'Malley, your favorite part." <laughs> no, that, that's okay. Just the. Uh, I don't know this the the song and the the way the graphics kick in. It's just it's it's so exciting. It gets you really pumped up. Uh, I I was this was actually came later. This idea of doing the credits. Um, the first cut of the film didn't have the credits at the start, and uh, it, maybe it I was, mentioned it was head spinning 
as a result, I think. I know. It was uh, like, I don't know where my, my um, I haven't got a spoon to do the name drop n- noise, but, um, <laughs> but it was Quentin Tarantino's suggestion. Hang on, I, I can Clang. get, hang on, I can get, a, I'm going to get a pen. I'll do, I'll do the name drop noise. If we have a name drop, give me, give me two seconds. Keep, talk amongst yourselves. Five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> this means there's going to be a lot of name dropping. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, w- I will say that I was, um, I was flipping through volume one the other day of Scott Pilgrim, the comic book, and, uh, this was a comic. I was I was shocked to find how how beat for beat the the first act of the film follows the the first book. You wrote a perfect first act. I wrote for a perfect a movie. first act. That's this is this is it's not very good. This is the name drop. Can you hear this? This is the name drop sound. Quentin Tarantino. There you go. <laughs> So that's that's number one. There might be more later. I yeah. have my I have my espresso cup and pencil ready at hand. <laughs> well, this is um. How much of the now this apartment um, is kind of based on where you used to live with your friend Chris, who was the real Wallace? Is that correct? Yeah, it's partly based on his his bedroom in our old apartment, and uh, and then another apartment that I shared with my girlfriend. Um, so it, it it was very weird to walk on this set. It's it's like a mishmash of my life. Did it blow your mind? I think it did. I think, I think it I did. Watched you walk onto that. I think that's set the point when my blown. mind was blown, and uh, it hasn't come back. What um. Did you ever have that poster on your wall? Where did that come from? Uh, I think I just would see it a lot. Um, I don't think I knew anyone that owned it, but I would see it uh, sort of being sold at, you know, college fairs and stuff. And I uh, always thought it was the most ridiculous thing anyone could have on their wall. So I, I put it on Scott's wall. The British version of that poster would be the tennis player scratching her butt. <laughs> was that a big thing in the States as well? I don't think I've ever seen it. I know it. what you're talking about. Google, Google search that. Tennis butt. <laughs> Make sure the safe search is off. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this and, and uh, Stacy is based on. It's funny, like during the press tour, Anna Kendrick on several points complained that she didn't have a, a fun facts list because Brian, Brian wrote a character list, uh, 10 things for. All it's of really the kind of a misconception. I think, I think Michael ended up writing the 10 things, and I, I kind of just gave him notes that he turned into 10 things. But the other thing that was funny about it was also that um, I said to, you know, that in, cause in terms of Stacey Pilgrim, I said, well, you had a real list. You had the person. <laughs> that Brian didn't need to write 10 things because it's yeah. his sister. We yeah. met her. We got coffee with her uh, at Second Cup, right? Yeah, and that's one right. Of our, one of our early trips. Yeah. That's right. And I know Anna met sort of Stacey as well. Now this um this school this was just in your neighborhood right yeah it was just around the corner from my house and it it's actually a boys school which now I this didn't find out till later this bit does not feature in the book so Brian tell us about it uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know what's going on here I think they're playing some sort of video game well yeah I I could say actually what the idea with this bit was is that very early on in the process and something that Brian never does in the books really so he never explains the fighting. And it was always like very early on, a, like a note from the studio about we have to explain the fighting in some way. And so this was kind of our way of showing a little bit of prowess in some respect. Right. I mean, it's like the, the metaphor behind the fighting is that, you know, if you've played Street Fighter or Tekken for years of your life and all of a sudden you get into a real life fight, you, that you would have those skills. Um, so this kind of just brings that a little more in line with reality. Like they've been playing a game where they actually punch and kick rather than just press buttons. Well, it's funny that the, there is there is definitely a theory that with um, driving simulations and flying simulations that those skills that you like could get on those games could actually sort of have some bearing in real life, including that, you know, that barefoot bandit guy learned how to fly on a computer game. Is that correct? Yeah, Microsoft Flight Sim. But... I don't think, you know, but this is the ultimate adolescent fantasy that if you were really good at tech and you could go out and beat the crap out of somebody. Exactly. Now, <laughs> if you're out there listening, do not attempt this in a bar. You will die. <laughs> and we will not pay the medical bills. So if you go out and sort of like you're really good at like uh, Mortal Kombat, that does not mean you are going to be able to beat the crap out of somebody. And if you are really good as a result, uh, we, we're not responsible for that either. <laughs> however, if, if you, you beat if, the crap out of someone else. However, if you're good at Dance Dance Revolution, then go dance your heart out. No one will get hurt. <laughs> now this, um, oh my God, see this is, it's, uh, now we're, that's a real squirrel by the way. That just, that was a fluky black squirrel. Really? I always notice a squirrel every time. <laughs> it was like, it's just one of those, like, It looks know. so fake. <laughs> but it was, it's also, I think Toronto squirrels look evil. They do. They're black. They're dark. They look like sort of, they look like Satan squirrels. And they're huge. They're nega squirrels. Yeah. They are nega squirrels. Like sort of gray squirrels look cute. Black squirrels look like they've kind of like been, I don't know. 
It's very sort of like, <laughs> they look satanic to me. I, I want to mention the music cue, which is another Plum Tree song. Plum Tree wrote Scott Pilgrim, which appears uh, a few minutes earlier. And then this song is called Go. This one is not on the soundtrack album because no. I, I tried to uh, stick to that Nick Hornby high fidelity rule of not having... Oh, one band per, per One thing, band, yeah. Uh, so if, if this album does well enough and we release a third... A third, a disc, third disc, then this will be on there. Right. Uh, now, the, this is jumping around in neighborhoods, but it's this is tricky, all around. Yes. This is all the one where you used to live, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's all sort of based around um, Davenport Road in Toronto. Now, you, the, Scott and Wallace's apartment, the outside of it, uh, you had a photo of it, but you couldn't remember exactly where it was. Could you? <laughs> yeah, I hadn't gone back to look for it, and this is before um, Google Maps Street View sort of came into. Uh, effect like I think it was a year or two ago in Toronto and uh, I didn't know where it was but you you guys found it you also found Ramona's apartment which I had never known where it was I think I was driving by it in a bus and took a picture out, out the window and you guys found it in Cabbage Town yeah yeah now you used to share a bed with your roommate uh, not my not my homosexual roommate uh, <laughs> and, and, and another roommate the year before yeah a heterosexual roommate. a heterosexual you roommate. have shared a bed with a man there's nothing I wrong have. with it I have Simon and Nick used to do it Bert and Ernie do it in Sesame <laughs> Street there's nothing wrong with it we, we would have a body pillow between us we, were, we were that uns unsure of our uh, masculinity a but... Japanese body pillow <laughs> <laughs> the girl on it yeah you uh, put a girl in between the two of you put a girl if two men are sleeping in the same bed at uh, same bed you have to put a lady in between pillow girl and this is the real library in my real neighborhood and would you use this library as a library I would uh, it kind of became overrun with homeless people after a while though <laughs> apparently that happens in a lot of libraries they're free homeless people love to read <laughs> known fact do they now is Scott Pilgrim now in this library I hope so I think it is you I know. believe it is I think when we went back for um when I think when we went back for the location thing, uh, like sort of shooting. I'm pretty sure it was there. I like the Virgin Mary in the background. Yeah. In the scene. That's, that's uh, that was in the comics, yeah. Yeah, that was in the comics. My also, friends always had strange uh, things that they would get at Goodwill or Value Village, just like weird Christian uh, imagery. Well, aren't those usually like the sort of Virgin Mary pictures, usually the thing that uh, somebody will, in a rented like apartment, it will already be there. Yeah, totally. Oh, just back in that scene, actually, on Queen Street West, if you look at the... Which oh, is, Fight Center. Yeah. I notice it every time. Yeah. The the L on the L uh, is flickering. The L is flickering. It's on the fritz, so it says Fight Center, um, which is from the comics. Yeah, oh, fight, that's the thing. Is Fight Center is in the comics. Yeah, we kind of had in to, volume four. We had to make it the L flicker, yeah. so it's kind of halfway there. This is a frat house in. Um, I'm not sure where this was in Toronto. I think it was near. Well, it's Yon in the university Street. district, I yeah. believe. Um, but I think a certain Michael McCall was in that last shot, and we missed it. I just said it's near Yonge Street, which also happens to be the longest street. Longest street in, in the world. Canada, in if, the you world. Wanna, if you want to find this, <laughs> if you want to find this frat house, just follow the smell. And For God's yeah. sakes, whatever you do, don't go just looking on Yonge Street. You'll be like Steve Buscemi in Fargo and die. <laughs> like that woman who went to find the money in Fargo. Did you ever hear that story? Oh, I think I did. Yeah. It might be a bit too morbid for this commentary, but uh, don't don't go looking. I don't want anybody to freeze to death. Yeah. Um, Col Colexico, also in the comic. We tried now. So ridiculous. Like, well, what, what would you say about our level of kind of like, so we, we got super kind of like OCD about getting oh, the yeah. details right. I would say super OCD, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we, wanted to, we wanted to represent. Oh, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. There's I also, like those gray balloons. I, know. I like I know. the light switch. <laughs> and the light switch in the sky. I just, it looks, the black balloons look so depressing as well. Also, if you listen, you can hear one of them pop when like sort of, when Scott kind of like a... This is actually one of my favorite bits in the whole film. Well, <laughs> Michael's, his, Michael's delivery of the Pac-Man speech really, the second time. really, really hard not to laugh. Oh my God. Day. Like, yeah, I, I crack up every time I see that scene. Now, the reason we wrote this Pac-Man speech is because the joke in the books is something that could not be translated to film. Right, it was very drawing-based. Yeah, there's no way of making the Mr. Silly's shoes joke work in live action, so we had to come up with something else. And I always liked that Pac-Man story. I always thought that was really interesting. I can't wait till I have the Blu-ray and I can pause through all these scenes because there some of them are like three frames. There's um well you can watch like Johnny Simmons is always looking lost. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Simmons is always looking for Scott even though Scott is right in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? Sandra Monique. Were they based on anybody real? They were named after uh, some girls that I knew in grade school. So uh, if the real Sandra and Monique are are watching this film, uh, I apologize hugely. 
The whole bit there with the um, the party goers was based on this early idea that me and Michael McCall had in the draft where one of the first things we did, because basically Brian was still writing the books as we were trying to write the script. We, we basically stalled for about five years until like <laughs> Brian had, had written as many books as we could, we could uh, use in the film. But we had this idea that I, I remember us going through very sort of um, painstakingly going through all the dialogue of John Hughes and Cameron Crowe films mm -hmm. and all rights of passage films, even things like American Graffiti and Gregory's Girl, yeah. and looking for any dialogue that had any kind of relevance to fights or league, you know, and so obviously she's out of your league and stuff. Um, 2010. Say anything. That yeah. Good, that was a good one. Yeah. So we tried to kind of mine like all of the um, the classic kind of teen sort of rites of passage films for rhyming dialogue, you know, that would fight in, you know, sort of tie in with the ideas of tournaments and this is this actually happened, right? This is a uh, yeah. The, it, it, I did I did share an apartment with a with a, a gay man and uh, he would come in after the bars drunk and would get <laughs> like kind of fall on my bed. We didn't share a room. But he would kind of lie on my bed and tell me how his night went, uh, and it was it was extremely annoying, but uh, also you know kind of charming. So uh, I put it in here for posterity. He never threw the house keys at your head, though, did he? No, that was a, an a invention Kier of the uh, Kieran Culkin. That was a Kieran Culkin special, and you notice that Kieran Culkin does it twice in two different shots, and he's a uh, Kieran is one of those people who has just a sort of like a whole arsenal of of little. A amazing bar tricks and things. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like something that he could do is like, yeah, you want me to throw the keys at Michael's head? I got it. And he'd like do it three times in a row. Yeah. This this is I shouldn't I shouldn't mention, but that's the one scene that uh, Stacy is working, and apparently it's the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, I kind of figured. Well, what time does we researched? Oh, there we is did, a twenty four you know, hour. There was a twenty four hour. There's one twenty four hour second. Nice. <laughs> because you know what we did? We, Saved your asses. Well, we screwed up because we shot a scene on the bus mm -hmm. with Stacy on the bus, and then Anna Kundrick quite rightly pointed out. Oh, you pointed it out as well. But you said it first, and then she said it, saying, um, "The line about like um, having you got a job to do doesn't work if I'm on the bus." And yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll put that alternate scene on the DVD, which makes no sense. Although it's kind of, it's uh, good for Stacey um, having the j same juice box as she has in the book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, what about the idea, like, because um, uh, a lot of people have commented on the fact that he has, like, an old PC desktop and he's still on AOL. Well, like, one of the things I love is that tuned down sound right there. Yeah, you can hear like, the disc no. spinning down. Yeah. That's so good. I know it's like the sort of it's like the PC version of like the Millennium Falcon kind of winding down. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Ben Burt special. <laughs> uh, and here Knives is already beginning her transformation into a completely nonsensical cool girl. line. I love that. <laughs> now what um tell us a little bit about without going into any detail that will get you in trouble, but tell us about the inspiration for Knives. Uh, where does the the name come from, Knives Chow? It's it's so hard to explain. <laughs> explain. Um, this is your okay, this okay. is your time. This is there, here forever. Uh, <laughs> this commentary track. This is your time. Uh, my fam We're ready at to my hear family's it. church when I was in my teens, there was a uh, a woman, uh, a church director who was named. I think her name was Neve or N N something like that, something along those lines. But I could never figure out how to pronounce it. Is I still it can't. Knives Campbell. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a name like that, and I kept uh, I kept getting it wrong, and eventually it was just stuck in my head as Knives, and I just kept it in my head for years and then eventually used it for this character. Brian, you just spun commentary gold. <laughs> that wasn't so hard to explain. That was amazing. All right. There you um, go. You win. Well, and then the other the other half of it was there was a friend of mine um, broke up with his girlfriend and she pulled a knife on him. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Slightly darker. So that was the darker side of the tale, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. Yeah. And even better, it's the TIBB. So now, I, I turned that into into fun. <laughs> <laughs> So suddenly the commentary took a darker turn. <laughs> it's all gone very... This is supposed to be a, a, a light and bubbly PG-13. Yeah. And Brian mm -hmm. Lee and just taken us into kind of like a whole world of hurt. <laughs> um, Ellen Wong made her own She made her own shirts. Yeah. That shows a level of dedication. Oh, my God. She was so dedicated. We tried to put in lots of details from the books, so the lame brand amps in the background there. Mm -hmm. And also even like... Uh, the 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 t-shirts alone, the clearance on the t-shirts, which was uh, uh, down to um, uh, Woody Brown and Karen Beaver, mm -hmm. our, our amazing clearance department, 
just took forever. But you know, I, I know I want a match pick shirt. I want a sharpie shirt. Sharpie. Did you, you, get, you got all of them. I didn't get any. You could have. You should have said something. You got a quilt. I got. I stole nice. all of Scott Pilgrim's shirts. Now I have to lose about thirty pounds to get into them. <laughs> Michael, Michael Sarah's frame is like uh, you know I'm I'm about twice as heavy as he is. P reference this number is, one. This is another uh, uh, one of my favorite Michael gags. The the towels hand drying. Yeah. What the really really perfunctory. <laughs> that always gets a laugh as well. Yeah, it's so good. And then this was a, a physical effect. You guys moved the set. That's right. The other thing worth listening out for that always makes me laugh is is um is is Michael doing like a Scooby Doo. <laughs> like when he comes out, he does the proper Scooby Doo noise. I never noticed that because the music kicks in. Yeah, and it's so. This is the Zelda music that's yeah. been talked about so much. Yeah, mm. this is a we 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 tried to kind of tra like blend that transition there with Scott waking up was based on. I think in in your artwork you had like him outside of the frame, like overlaid. Yeah, yeah. I always really love that and trying to figure out a way to do that in live action. Mm -hmm. It's been really nice. A lot of people have mentioned the transitions, like throughout, and and uh, you know, and and also what's nice is a lot of people have mentioned, like even just beyond kind of replicating the the panels, but like how it feels like reading a comic, which I mm -hmm. think is a nice thing. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of feel like it feels like it maybe doesn't feel like reading a comic if you're a slow reader. I think it's maybe like reading. Yeah, the way you flick your eyes flick through from scene to scene, and you 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 know you're in the next scene before you even know it. Really, are you a speed reader? I, I am, yeah. Well, I mean, with a lot of this, these types of comic, the Japanese comics, you're supposed to read them pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, and they're 35 volumes, you know, like 7,000 pages of comics. So you kind of have to read them fast in order to get through them. Well, I feel like that's what, when people talk about the pace of this film, uh, one of the things, and this isn't something that really occurred to me until people kept asking about the pace. It made me realize how I used to read Marvel comics, is I used to read them in like 20 minutes flat, if that. Mm -hmm. And then I would go back and look at the artwork. Yeah. So I would say probably the perfect way to watch this film is watch it at normal speed, and then any time it comes to an action scene, slow it down on the frame advance, and then, <laughs> and then, then you can look through it like you would read a Frank Miller book. Is read it, read it fast once, second time slow it down, third watch just look for numbers and X's, fourth watch um, just watch Johnny Simmons, uh, fifth watch watch it backwards, watch it backwards. Yeah. Um, is there an album that like you'd like to you think it should be played alongside? Scott Pilgrim, hmm, Dark Side I'm of the Moon sure. style. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe something by the Smashing Pumpkins. Mm. Oh, there you go. Well, <laughs> obviously, like, um, you know, The Infinite Sadness, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. Yeah, that's a pretty long, I guess that's probably about, it's about two hours. I think it'll there probably work. Yeah. There you go. All right. Let's start that rumor now is that, that it, it syncs up with the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> People complained to me uh, at some of the Q&As that there wasn't a Smashing Pumpkins song on the soundtrack. And I said, well, he's, they have a t-shirt. They have two t-shirts. It's pretty well represented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I love this stuff, just to get back to, uh, to Edgar Wright again. Uh, it was a, it's a real park. This is a real park that I would go to with my girlfriend around the corner from my old house, and uh, it, it's transformed into something magical here. Yeah, it's really sweet. I mean, this is what's crazy is we're on location here. You can't see yeah. you can't see anything. In the Why were you on location? I, well, it, it, there's it, part of it. The bit on the swings back there mm -hmm. was on a set. We actually went back and reshot the swings. Mm -hmm. Um... But this is real. This is on location, which is crazy. At like four in the morning, it was yeah. cold. It was really cold. It really, fe it felt quite. It felt really magical, like doing this stuff. But it has that feeling to it. It feels like a real place. Yeah. Now that was really important, you know, because I think some people assumed that the it was going to be like a a Sin City, mm -hmm. you know, style adaptation, and you know, I was really intent. Uh, because of the content of it, and m maybe after something like Speed Racer, which was all completely green screen, I was, I had this idea already, but it made me even more intent on shooting it on real sets and real locations mm -hmm. as much as possible. So there wasn't ever a full. Well, people have commented that these these apartments feel the most like real, uh, scummy, you know, twenty something year old apartments uh, of any film. So they we they do. They feel exactly like the places I used to live. My friends used to live. That's great. I know, I, Mary has said on a number of occasions that she would want to live in this apartment. Sorry, I'm just cold. Here, does that help? She even has a good record collection. I remember flipping through Oh yeah, there. we never got a shot of that. There's a couple of things that we actually got the clearance of and you barely see it. Like, um, I think there was a Fargo poster on the wall that was exactly like the one from the books. And oh just, yeah, the knit one. And maybe there was only one shot that had it and we ended up cutting it out. Nice. This is, um... 
Michael playing along with Beachwood Sparks. <laughs> <laughs> this is a song that, um, well, here's a good thing to talk about. The, 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 um, a lot of the songs on the soundtrack are from playlists that um, Brian did for each book because you used to make a playlist to, and you didn't publish it in the end of volume one. You started that with volume no, two, is that right? I, maybe not even volume two. I think it, it, it was a while before I started talking about it really. But yeah, I would just kind of make a mixtape for myself and uh, just get the mood going. And this is this was one of the songs from the mixtape. Yeah. I think there's probably about three or four songs from the mixtape in the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, then, and then we would start trading stuff back and forth. Actually, I was cleaning up the other day and I found... The four discs that Edgar sent me. <laughs> I felt like when we first met, like I, I felt like you were my long distance girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like that too. That was very weird. It was quite sweet. It was like we didn't really talk too much about the film. We just used to send each other the music. <laughs> but you know what's really funny? I heard Ramona sing that song because we talked about that. As one of, mm-hmm. I think on the, our first conversation on the phone, we talked about that Frank yeah. Black song. And what's really strange about that is that I remember when that album came out, I was at our college and there was this girl at school who was still at high school and we bonded over that album. And so, and her name wasn't like Ramona, but I used to think about her whenever I heard that song. So it's that weird thing where it has this relevance going back to like 1993. I mean, it's just really <laughs> strange. And I never, it was an unconsummated, uh, we never actually went out. Well, so Hannah, if you're listening. made a film for her. Hannah, if you're listening. What what the hell just, what the hell happened? <laughs> it's 2010. For God's sakes, you're probably married now. Yeah. Anyway, don't worry about it. I'll send I'll send you another mixtape. I'll send you a mixtape on cassette. Yeah. With I heard I hear Ramona sing being track number one. Yeah. Oh, here we are with the rocket. Now this is a place where you. It's based on a real place where you actually played, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In 2003, I was in a band and uh, we played a. Uh, we played a battle of the bands at, at the Rocket. Did we, you win? We were full of terrible teen punk bands. What was we, your... we were just kind of there for a laugh. It was uh, mm. it was fun. And what was the name of your band? Should I say that? Yeah. On the air? Yeah. Uh, it was called Imperial Otter. What, what? My favorite band name of all time. It's a good one. Where do, um, now, now this, this venue itself is a little bigger than the actual one. But, oh, I think I talked about this. Maybe I mentioned this already. But Eric Knudsen, who plays Crash, actually played in... The real rocket. He as played well. in one of those battle of the bands too. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Well, the the real club was about half the width, I think. Yeah. Um, but this this is a lot easier to shoot in. Yeah. And then of course it, it shut down. I think in two thousand four and turned into something else. What was really sweet there was a we had a screening in New York where John Spencer and uh, Christina Martinez and um, Yola Tango turned up. And they all commented on the venues and how realistic they were, and they all believed that the Lee's Palace set was real yeah they all thought we'd shot in the real lee's palace until i pointed out that a it was the old bar and b we had to smash the walls in yeah but that was that was very pleasing to me that the um these guys who've probably seen every music venue in north america thought that they looked authentic that was the seal (laughs) of approval yeah something like this oh here we go now that kinks t-shirt was in the books right yeah that was the shirt that my uh my friend Luke used to wear, um, who uh, Crash was named after. Was his name Luke Wilson? It was Luke Wilson, yes. Just like, <laughs> the, not- like the famous actor, but not the famous actor. Um, yeah, he had that exact shirt, and we, we went back and forth, me and the clearance department, finding that exact shirt, which was It was like a tour t-shirt, insane. right? Yeah. It was like an 80s kink shirt. The guy Joel, who's playing... Oh, no, the guy Maury, who's playing Joel... He watched it for the first time the other day, and I said, did you like the Ds coming out of your base? And he goes, what Ds? And I said, <laughs> I said, were you just watching your own face? You were so kind of like wrapped up in the fact that you were on screen that you <laughs> completely missed the animation. Um, so, how do you know Scott? <laughs> this, He's a friend. This, thing, uh, this bit, like, always makes me laugh every time is when... when um, Michael starts spazzing out here and Nigel Godridge's music cue, which sounds like something from Doctor Who. This, this is bit. a nightmare, yeah. This it makes me laugh every time. This is a nightmare. I remember somebody, uh, like not mentioning it, I remember somebody from the studio or one of the producers questioning the interior monologue stuff, which I know that the three of us sitting here find it enormously funny it's and a, childish. It's very entertaining. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but that's very sort of true to, the in- idea of internal monologue is very true to a lot of... Um, you know, like Asian cartoons, because That's a lot my of... my friend Matt. Matt Watts, <laughs> Matt yeah. Matt Watts. 
He's probably one of the few people over 30 in this film. He is, yeah. He should be exterminated, Logan's Run style. <laughs> really. There'll be a later edition of like the Logan's Run edition where yeah. Matt Watts, Thomas Jane, and Clifton Collins Jr. have all been erased from the film. <laughs> all right, maybe during this musical interlude we can talk about how, uh, how the music evolved. Uh, I remember Michael has been talking about uh, in early drafts you were trying to to hide the music. That's right. We had this joke because um, because there's always this feeling of like most fictional bands and films suck. We had this joke in the first draft of the um, first draft of the movie where, say, like the opening scene, like Sex Bomb would play, you'd hear the intro, and then it would cut to Knives saying, "Oh my God, that was the best song ever. The lyrics were amazing." And you and in this scene as well, like it was supposed to be that they just kick in and Patel interrupts them immediately, and I think it was. Once we started getting the Beck songs, I remember Nigel Godridge when he, I said about, I, sh I remember I cut together something with storyboards as an example of how. And he was like, you're not going to show the whole song. What's yeah. wrong with you? Yeah, basically. And you know, he was right. I, I kind of feel like um, as, as funny as that joke would have been. I, I kind of love the bits where it just starts to turn into a musical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if there was ever any director's cut, like, I think it would probably just be that the songs would be longer. Even more, yeah. You would hear, like, the whole of Black Sheep and the whole of this. Yeah. You, I mean, there's only 30 seconds more of this song, which is elsewhere mm -hmm. on the DVD. Now, just in terms of, like, a, 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 an original genesis, like, what first gave you the idea for Scott Pilgrim fighting exes? Where did that come from? I'm asking the tough questions <laughs> so that's, now. That is the toughest question. I threw question. in, this is my Charlie Rose moment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, like I said earlier, it's the whole, the the Street Fighter thing. Um, you know, just having played Street Fighter and imagining that one day someone will fly at you and you will become Street Fighter. Um, the other thing is, I mean, this character's name is Matthew Patel. Uh, at one point I found out that my girlfriend, uh, who's now my wife, uh, had dated three guys named Matthew. Like, not <laughs> oh. at the same time. Um, and I just thought that was that was funny. Like, what if there was a league of Matthews? And that kind of spun out <laughs> from there. So the first guy was named Matthew in, in an homage to her. Are you saying that this film could have been called Scott Pilgrim vs. the Matthews? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Three Matthews? The verses. That's the first verses. I love those. I mean, you so see, good. Matthews seem so unthreatening until there's three of them. Oh, you yeah. Get, you get a trio of Matthews and you're in trouble. <laughs> well, originally, the uh, Lucas Lee was going to be named Matthew Lee. Ah. There was, they were all, not all of them were going to be named Matthew, but I thought that was too much. Too many Matthews. For our numerologists in the audience, um, here's the first one. Um, Matthew Patel has one chevron. In yes. the books, he in the has book two, he had right? two, but we discussed it. That's before. right. We changed him to one. We took off two chevrons because we thought he shouldn't have a two ranking. He should have a one ranking. So if you're if you're doing if you're doing a Matthew Patel costume for Halloween, you could either go with the book version and have two chevrons, <laughs> or the film version and have one. Yeah. And uh, it would you'd be right either way. This fight was actually dangerous. Michael got punched in the head, and during the rehearsal, I remember he got kicked in the throat by Jar Jar. Jar Jar, who was Patel's stunt double, I think in the bit coming up in a second, when they were rehearsing it, I think it's this shot in any second now, actually, where during the rehearsal, Jar Jar kicked Michael full in the throat. There I think go. so, maybe. That one. Maybe. Oh. You know what, I, I always... I have to say, those incidents were few and far between because our stunt crew... They'd probably be really mad at me for saying there were any accidents because yeah. they're so professional yeah. and amazing, you know. So, yeah. uh, you well, know, what? it didn't happen. Hundreds of takes. You know what? I'm going to say in this commentary, Michael never got kicked in the throat. <laughs> no, I was just saying that for effect. The stunt team are amazing. Um, what? Now, just just as a now, uh, Brian. <laughs> That's my friend Steve Manelli. He got this prime placement as an extra, and it was just ridiculous. I found him on set one day. He was trying to keep it a secret. I oh, really? Yeah, he signed up without me knowing. But he's got he's right between Patel and Scott as they're punching and kicking. Like you see him so many times, it's ridiculous. Now I remember that when you first saw this, I showed you like the director's cut like maybe 9 months before we finished it. And first I remember you saying you weren't sure about these bits or you found it weird watching your animation. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it now? Oh, I think they did an amazing job. Um I like the second one better because it's uh I didn't draw most of it, right? <laughs> so, but I, I always just feel that way about everything. I think it was really sweet. I remember the first screening at Comic Con when your artwork came out. There was a random there was a huge, oh, yeah. huge roar. Yeah, yeah, that was really sweet. Now here's here's another question: Is unlike Alan Moore, 
um, Brian, you, you watched every single casting tape of this film. Is that is that correct? I did, yeah. And how was that experience? And how did you feel watching the people who are now in the film? Uh, I mean, it, watching Satch's audition, which is quite incredible. Oh yeah, yeah. Satya was my first choice. This guy's good. It, I don't know. I mean, I, I've always deferred to you as you know the casting genius that you are. Thank um, you. But you, 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 know, you shared everything with me, which is uh, everything, which is amazing. <laughs> we shared. It's it's been lovely. As, ladies and gentlemen, we shared everything, and I mean <laughs> everything. I saw um I saw at the rap party in Toronto or the Toronto premiere. I saw. Christine, who was the um, dancing demon hipster chick. Oh, really? Who probably had the worst day of the shoot because she was on this rig. She had to perform the song about 40 times. Oh, my God. Uh, it was probably the most craziest day of the whole shoot because we had to play Dan the Automator's Patel song like 40 times in a row. Oh, wow. And uh, it was mental. That was the KO from an actual Street Fighter game. I don't remember which one. Uh, I believe for, it actually we replicated it. Oh really? Yeah, we I think so. We didn't. It's Bill Hader doing it. We didn't use the real one. Oh, excellent. Because I think the real one's from Street Fighter Alpha Three. Alpha is that right? Three, yeah. But that was Bill Hader doing oh, that's Street great. Fighter. I never knew. Well, we He's didn't. Genius. You know, like sort of. And here's here's the kiss. <laughs> I still can't believe we got that in there. I know. Thanks, MPAA. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for not being homophobic. <laughs> Cheers. Um, I saw. I remember. I saw like um, because sometimes same sex kissing is a problem. Um you know, uh, with the ratings board. And then I saw Fast and Furious, the fourth Fast and Furious, and they had two girls kissing in a PG-13. I was thinking, I'm going to use that as reference. That's great. There goes Action Doctor on the bus. Yeah. Which I realized I made up. It's in the background of Volume 2. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I had it's no in, idea. It's in Queen Video or Suspect <laughs> yeah, Video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Queen Video, Suspect I, Video. It's Suspect Video, but it's called No Account Video in the store. That's the, right. Oh, they, but it's uh, based on... Oh. It's based, based upon Suspect Video, who I respect. Now, yeah, well, you'd forgotten that you came up with Action Doctor? Yeah, it's just buried in the background along with all these other absurd movies. I know, we, we, we read them all and we sort of like, we, we would, me and Michael Bacall would pour through the book with a magnifying glass looking for all these little <laughs> nuggets. We made lists. Um, Big. The, Sein, the Seinfeld, like, bass riff, like, isn't, I guess, ba basically, if you want to get a huge laugh from an audience, I guess put that Seinfeld music in every single film. <laughs> it's a winner. Or in every scene. In every scene, it's a winner. It's like sort of just has a sort of, like that just almost always gets a huge response. Um, I, watched the, I love him changing his t-shirt here. Oh yeah, instantly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was in camera, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in camera. <laughs> Kieran Culkin stayed still and we, you can kind of see, well, you can't see the cut because it's, because, uh, you know, it's pretty slick. <laughs> but basically, Kieran yeah. Culkin stand and stood and still whilst my Here's Kieran with no pants on, which is never called attention to, but it's uh, he takes his pants off. He did go for the boxers rather than the briefs. Mm -hmm. I think he he he. What does Wallace wear in the books? Briefs. I think he wears briefs, boxer right? briefs. Boxer briefs. Yeah. <laughs> which volume is he just in boxer briefs the entire? Four? I think it's four. Yeah. It's, the, it's the summer one. <laughs> now you never had an experience where, um, like. Uh, you know, Stacey had never had an experience where, like, sort of Wallace turned her boyfriend in real life. No. Um, but the, the whole rocket scene, the kissing scene, was based on a scene when um, when Chris and Stacey came to my show at the Rocket. And uh, Stacey brought a boy, and Chris definitely had eyes on the boy. Ah, there you go. So I, I, uh, I turned that into fun, too. Now, some people have uh, assumed that, like, Spike and Coke Zero are, like, sort of product placement... And and the fact of the matter is, is that we in the original script it was TBS Superstation, <laughs> but then we realized. <laughs> but then that, it doesn't exist in Canada. That's anymore. right. TBS Superstation doesn't exist in Canada anymore. So Spike was the only channel that we could think of that might have a Lucas Lee marathon. They wanted it to be realistic. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then Coke Zero is because as a part of the numerical the numbering thing, system. The numbering system. Scott is zero. Scott is a zero. Gideon is seven. And we had this kind of you know we want to have this uh, ranking chart. This is Bloor and Bathurst. This was, yeah. I would describe this as like this crossroads as the, this intersection as being the heart of Scott Pilgrim Country. It is, yeah. yeah. Is that somewhere you'd hang around a lot? Yeah, I mean, I used to work at the, the Beguiling, the comic store right there. And, uh, you know, Honest Dad's is right there, this crazy landmark. Uh, and yeah, people, Toronto crew commented on that because the center of Toronto is not there. It's, it's like six or eight blocks east of there. But, but this is the center of uh, Scott Pilgrim Country for sure. 
And had you frequented that pizza pizza on Bloor and Bathurst a lot? Yes, yes, I had at all hours of the day and night. Had you ever been in there hammered? Uh, I, pizza. I believe so, yes. I think most people in Toronto. Yeah, had you ever right? been in there not hammered? <laughs> not hammered. <laughs> uh, maybe one time at 11 a.m. Um, but and Sonic Boom as well. You know, I spent a lot of time flipping through CDs, which is the, something you don't see so much anymore. You don't hear that sound. That sound of clack, 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 clack. It's clack. almost extinct. Yeah. It's almost extinct. Soon. There's Amoeba in LA. There's Sonic Boom. I don't know. I remember when you took us to this uh, to Sonic Boom for the first time. It had my mind blown. It's a particular sound of an era as well, because like flipping through vinyl doesn't make a noise. But <laughs> yeah. Flipping through jewel case CDs, which are horrible, let's face it. Yeah, cardboard ones are nice, but jewel cases are horrible. It produces a like a, a quite a pleasing clack. It's it probably is very one of satisfying. The, it's probably one of the few things that are good about CD cases. Very metronomic. Uh, on that bus there, there's the uh, another Lucas Lee movie, which I always find funny. It's like he's got about eight movies in theaters at the moment. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's actually like a poster for the um, the new film by it won't be new by the time the DVD comes out, but uh, Dwayne Johnson's film Faster, which looks like a Lucas Lee poster because it, it's called the film is called Faster. It stars The Rock and it just looks like a Lucas Lee poster because the tagline is "Slow justice is no justice," <laughs> which is a tagline. You could have made that one up. I know that sounds like it's from the the one that was on the bus back there is "The Game Is Over" too. And the tagline is, one good cop is done fooling around again. <laughs> really torturously I, long tagline. Yeah, I think we collaborated on that one. Yeah. But Action Doctor was all you, right? Yeah. It was uh, Schwartzman. That was Schwartzman for the first part of the line and me for the second. Oh, what, in, your, good... in your apartment. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, the good news is you're going to live. The, the bad, bad news, news is he's going to kill you. <laughs> and then my favorite but part. yours was check your pulse. Check, yeah, yeah, it was like, check your pulse, May 8th. That's the, I don't that... know why May 8th kind of stood out to me as like a summer movie. May, check your pulse, May 8th. Did you guys use the Mission Impossible uh, poster for that one? Uh, it's uh, yeah, very, def- uh, very, very Ethan Hunt. Yeah, it's very yeah. Ethan Hunt. Ethan Hunt sounds like Cockney rhyming I think it's, I think he's got a little bit of a born identity thing going, too, with the That target. guy's a right, uh, Ethan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy's a right, Ethan. <laughs> this is now for that in a future Jason Statham film. Yeah. Got any embarrassing stories? Yeah. I think Ramona's blue hair is my favorite of the three colors. I, you disagree? Uh, I think I like the pink best. I like I've always it. had a thing for pink and red. A bit of a foot fetish. That's shot. for Quentin. That is for Quentin. <laughs> Mary said that just before her take. <laughs> yeah, I, she leaned into seriously. She leaned into the camera and said, "For Quentin, I got to give it to him. I should actually give that to him as a present." You should. I think sort of probably we wouldn't see him for days when he gets that kind of like <laughs> shot and be lo- lo- lost in a foot fetish uh, fantasy. Uh, I love Wallace eating the parsley here. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino is the Russ Meyer of the lower track. <laughs> <laughs> now this cook thing that was from the books is that based on anything particularly? Uh, no. It's just, like, so just simple. Yeah, I just always like to write simple things or absurd things. Now, what about the, what about Scott's parka? Did you ever used to wear a parka? Yeah, I wore a parka for years and years. Uh, I probably still have it. Um, my, my dad bought it for me. I think it was from Sears. It was just like a very generic blue parka with fur fringe. And, I, uh, I used to have one when I was a kid exactly like that with the orange inside the collar, the fur fringe. Right. But then it was weird. We were looking for them, and they didn't really make them anymore until... The day that Schwartzman came in, wearing one that he'd had since he was 12. He was wearing his, like, he's obviously had the same, like, been the same shape and height since he was 12. And he came (laughs) into the restaurant in some Portuguese restaurant in Toronto where we had a sort of cast dinner wearing this parka. I said, where did you get that? And he said, I've had it since I was 12. And inside the collar it had, this belongs to Jason. It was genuinely (laughs) like a a kid's parka that he was still wearing. (laughs) Michael still has his parka from the set. Oh, yeah. he, on the last day did of the you... shoe, he he didn't take it off. Can't wait to hear when it's finished. I can hear somebody's phone. Is that my phone going? Probably. <laughs> and so I'm getting an important call. I'll turn it off. If you if you out there in Blu-ray land, if you can hear this um, oh, iPhone yeah. interference, this is a uh, this is me. I'm it's now, all Edgar Wright's fault. It's all my. I'm doing the red slider right now. Slide to power off. It's gone. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> if that if that in any way impeded your enjoyment, I apologize. It's gone. It's gone. Now, um, was this the, the the actual haircut thing based on any? Uh, I definitely have. Had I just those. hated getting haircuts. I never actually had a breakup because of a haircut, but 
I definitely had a moment where I'd broken up with somebody when I had a spot yeah. and I thought the spot was the whole reason. So I can definitely vibe with Scott Pilgrim. I remember sort of going out with a girl and it going really badly and having like a spot and swearing blind that the spot was the sole reason that she split up with me. So I can really empathise with Scott Pilgrim about the idea that having a haircut is the reason why MP yeah. left him. Yeah. This is when I was 12. And to be honest, <laughs> Scott Pilgrim acts like a 12-year-old quite a lot of the time. He would does. that be fair? That would be very fair. Here we are at the real uh, Casa Loma stairs. Yeah. Spadina. Um, and explain um, explain how the whole thing of the Lucas Lee Castellano set thing came up. This is another convoluted story. Uh, but this is what commentaries are for. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I used to live right near Castellano, and um, and I knew they had shot X Men there. I didn't know much else about it. I think I had been there on a tour as a child. Um, but one day we walked by, and they were shooting a film that was a, a Hillary Duff movie called The Perfect Man, and I just sort of filed it away. And uh, I think it was. It must have been 2004, because I was already starting to write the second Scott Pilgrim. Uh, and then, you know, the movie started rolling soon after. Not rolling, but, you know, uh, I talked to you. I talked to the producers. The producers turned out to be Mark Platt and Adam Siegel and Jared LaBeouf, who had made The Perfect Man. There you go. That sounds like an, that sounds like a bit of, like, um, scientific fact. Mark <laughs> Platt, Adam Siegel, and Jared LaBeouf had made... The perfect man. <laughs> it sounds like a bit of science, like a scientific well, experiment. Yeah, the strangest thing now is, you know, we, we went back, we made another movie, uh, a movie about making a movie in this same location. And then the other night, Jared and I were playing the Scott Pilgrim video game, which has a level uh, of a movie set at Casa Loma with you, Edgar, as yeah. the director. <laughs> and we felt very strange playing that game. The, the, uh, as Michael just pointed out, back there, the director is played by Don McKellar. Don McKellar. Canadian legend. Like, Canadian royalty, Don McKellar, surely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Director of Last Night, one of my favorite films. Me too. I loved it Last Night. In fact, I I met Don McKellar because I'd mentioned Last Night in an interview during my Shaun of the Dead press in Toronto. They'd asked about other post-apocalyptic films, or, and I mentioned Last Night as a, one of my favorite films, and Don McKellar got in touch, which is very sweet. Um, now, your friend uh, makes that T-shirt, right? The Pixel Skull? Oh, that's right, yeah. R. Stevens. Clango.org. There you go. Get yes. him some, get get him him some plug. money. Uh, I remember being there for that stunt where, where uh, Scott falls through the uh, like three layers of scaffolding. I think it was it the was, first big stunt. It was the yeah. first big stunt. It was very painful to watch. Yeah. Eight times. Now, I have to point out some twos. There All is right. a two on Lucas Lee's car coming up right now. You see it? Beautiful, two, two, beautiful car. Two, there's a Tibetan two on his shoulder, his little neck tattoo on the is other side. Is that what side. that is? Yeah, it's yeah. a Tibetan two. And on his belt, two X's. That's right. There you go. And even the Lucas Lee symbol is made up out of two L's. Although you had that already, right? Or did we make that up? You made that up. Okay, I made that up. I'm going to take the full... <laughs> you, I'll buy front of In front of Brian Lee Manning, I'm going to take credit for one idea in this film. <laughs> but yeah, so there's a bunch of twos in this film. And that's... Uh... That was Ruben, right? The first double? And yeah, Ma Ruben Max, Langdon. our trainer. The, yeah, Max on, on the, the right. right. The first on the right. First on the right was our fight trainer, who was amazing. He was actually... Max White, you can see him in Kick-Ass, actually. He turns up in Kick-Ass on screen, but also... Wasn't he in 300? He's in 300. He's he the, was, well, he's one of the sets of abs. That's right. He's also um, Hellboy's like fight double as well. So he's running in the Hellboy makeup a lot. That whole scene in Hellboy 2 with the baby is Max White. This is the first fight scene you showed me cut together. And how and did you I, feel? I was, uh, I had to be quiet for a while after this yeah. scene. Yeah, I was very, I was very excited. Um, I said, I said to Brad Allen, who is our amazing stunt coordinator, I said that I wanted this fight to feel very police story esque, mm -hmm. Jackie Chan esque, and you know, one of the things that like is nice about because we always, I always had this feeling that Jackie Chan, I love Jackie Chan, and he was definitely the martial artist that I grew up with. And I, what I love about Jackie Chan is he's the only martial artist whose signature move is defensive. Mm -hmm. Like Bruce Lee is like an, an, an aggressor, or Bruce Lee is like sort of his move is like, you yeah. know, kind of, um, you know, uh, saying, come on, I can take you all. And, yeah. uh, you know, flicking his hand towards like the other opponent. This, this scene, I've never understood why this scene happens, but it's so funny. <laughs> Just this like endless run and then the, the heartbeat thing. Oh, yeah. It makes me laugh. Just seeing Michael Cera really going for it in slow motion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and everyone laughs at that scene. Every time. That's that's one of my favorite stunts. There you go. CN Tower. CN Tower. There you go. I don't know if anyone caught that in the Toronto premiere. 
I heard, so I heard, quick. I heard reports of people watching. I, you know what? One of my, one of my big regrets is not being in Toronto for opening weekend because I've heard, I've heard tales of, um, like the Scotia Bank, which is the theater that we used to go to every weekend, because it was right around the corner from our apartment. That like the screenings there, people were going bananas for the film, but particularly any time there was a Canadian reference. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, I, I heard the Canadian audiences when it said right at the start. You know, Toronto, Canada, mm -hmm. the, the audience broke into applause, which Ooh. makes me very happy. Yeah, that's very sweet. Can you do a thingy on that? Break? Now, um, yeah, Michael's doing his tribute to Frank Drebin there. <laughs> the the uh, doing like sort of <laughs> yeah. putting his hand in, like, over his mouth, like the, rubbing his nose is his like little tribute to Leslie Nielsen in Police Squad. <laughs> yeah. This is, oh, I love that shot. That, it's, it's beautiful. That matte painting is just beautiful. It's amazing. Cool. You really think you can go with me to doing a trick like this? Well, talk about, tell us about the inspirations for Lucas Lee. It's kind of partly based on Jason Lee-ish, but not really. No, well, just, uh, you know, a little bit my, my old roommate who I uh, shared the bed with was a, a huge skater. So we were talking about Jason Lee a lot and uh, how he turned to an actor. And I, whether or not that made him a sellout was like kind of the discussion. Oh, right. Um, so yeah, that was just kind of the, the germ for the idea of Lucas Lee. What was the... He's a lot hunkier than Jason Lee, though, Lucas Lee, isn't he? Well, yeah, we you know we turned into a big, big, uh, bulky action star. I think sort of. Um... Oh my god, this is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that was a reshoot. That was, uh, yeah. was an additional little bit that we did. Yeah. I cut. I told Michael Sarah to do the last while like a Muppet. Wow! He suddenly turns into a beaker. But it's like it, it's like this unresolved moment. So his <laughs> mouth, his mouth is open forever for all eternity, as far as we know. I imagine like sort of like Frank Oz puppeteering Michael Cera at that, that <laughs> moment. <laughs> That's a crazy transition. Rune. This is the second time I've stolen a joke from election because almost exactly the same. Almost exactly the same. Like uh, joke is in Hot Fuzz when when Nicholas is uh, Nicholas Angel is leaving a message for Frank Butterman and he says it's Nicholas by the way, <laughs> and it's like a joke from Election. My favorite joke from Election when Matthew Broderick is freaking out and leaving that voicemail and then he put like it's Jim by the way. So uh, Alexander Pelham. I love the Scott Pilgrim. Like uh, you know he has to he has to clarify that he is th this Scott Pilgrim. Well, it works in the context of this film because he doesn't yeah. know how many you know she's gonna. She, she, may have, she could have dated three guys named Scott and listen, three guys named Matt. Listen, she's been out with three Matthews. She could have easily <laughs> had more than one Scott. You don't know. Do you ever feel like... Well, here's a, there was another joke that we had in the first draft, which kind of... Um, and also something that... Here's a question is, do you feel like Ramona has more than seven exes? Do you, or do you feel... Because I, I like the idea that every person that she dated turned and that's her entire history. Or do you think there's more? I, th I think in the book, I do mention that she dated a guy... Who is who is kind of a dick that was not full blown evil. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I didn't want to be like too clear about it. I mean, it's pretty nebulous. Even if some of these guys, some of these guys hardly qualify as dating. Like Matthew Patel, like yeah. she kissed him once in seventh grade. Well, that's also we had a joke in the first draft of the script where we had the nice ex, the one, right. the one nice ex, F Philip, Philip, Philip. <laughs> Philip the nice ex, yeah, and it was going to be Michael Bacall. It was Michael Bacall's cameo, basically. Damn it! I know. <laughs> it you said you have three or four other it's ones. It's my destiny. More than a sickly Mexican orphan in the eighteen, you yeah. could have been Philip the nice ex. Because there was a joke. I think it was in the Roxy sequence during the. The whole bit about have you ever dated somebody yeah. that wasn't a total ass? Little argument, says, yeah. yeah, this guy Philip, and he comes in and goes, "Hello." Do you remember what the dialogue was? <laughs> I can't remember at <laughs> all. He had a little monologue. <laughs> it sounded like you did. Um, maybe, maybe like the sequel to Scott Pilgrim could be Scott Pilgrim just beating the crap out of all Scott the Pilgrim nice people. Scott Pilgrim versus the nice exes. The nice yeah. exes. <laughs> Matthew two and three. Philip. Yeah. <laughs> Be like sort of like some strange like revenge film. It's like <laughs> he ca he gets called like he at the start of the film he's in like a sort of a Tibetan monastery and he gets called back into duty and said, "We found that Ramona has some more exes. <laughs> They're nice guys and you got to take them out." Yeah, we can do this in about forty years. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael Cera will still look twenty two. I love that Wallace has his monogrammed initials here, and I yeah. on this viewing I noticed in an earlier scene he's got it on his sleeve too. I hadn't noticed that. Before. Oh yeah. Here's, hey, well, here's a here's whole bunch seven of X's. X's. Now, oh, beyond boy. even the seven X's, I did put... Now, why are five yellow and two white? Uh, I have no idea. Because two are gone. 
Mm. Yellow is for the five ah. that are still alive. The two white ones are the ah. two dead ones. See, I think I think about this yeah. shit. I swear to God. <laughs> Now, this is something, this is another scene that's straight from the books and one that we fought very hard to keep in the final cut. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's so funny. May, Wh May Whitman, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's been one of the biggest uh, fan responses, fans of the book responses, is that frame. Yeah, oh, the there. point. It looks yeah. just like the, uh, the Look, book. I, I seem to remember there being a cat in the background of one of these shots. Maybe it was gone in post. <laughs> <laughs> This is in Cabbage Town. In the books, in Volume Four, it's kind of summer, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that was one. That was one of the main changes with the adaptation that we we did is that we had to kind of compress the yeah, time. Yeah, you kind of squash it down to a, a week and a half. Yeah. How to lose a guy in ten days? <laughs> <laughs> I always love that practical effect of the smoke there. So yeah, good. as a proper like Wizard of Oz path. Oh yeah. Mm. Or oh, like Monty Python. Yeah. That's exactly why I gave the, the the. I said I said you know the bit with Tim. Like the warlock in Monty Python, it should, it should be like that, like an old-fashioned flash. Yeah, this pop. is the shot with my sister in it. Oh yeah, we'll we put it. a special Mac sound for her. Listen, I think I'll make it. A you hear that? <laughs> Did you hear it? Yeah, yeah, that's wow. great. That's I thought sort of to draw attention to Stacy. We should yeah. put like a little Mac sound when you see her working on yeah. her laptop. I, I I didn't see her until the uh, the Toronto premiere, and then then I was sitting beside her, so we both saw her, and she's in this next scene too, I think. So this I never. This was in the script. Yeah. This whole uh, censorship mouth thing. And I was like, what? How is he going to do that? And I, you did it. It's magical. Well, I like this idea of, you know, because people, it's funny, sort of, a lot of people kind of mention about the onomatopoeic graphics and sound effects um, and say, oh, it's just like the Batman TV series. But my, my feeling was, and obviously it's the way you draw in the books and it's part of the, the style, but I felt like it had a real reason to be in the film because I felt like Scott Pilgrim would live his life like this. Yeah. Like one, one, of the th one of the things that Brian said, which was number one on the top 10 fun facts for the actors, was that Scott Pilgrim is the hero of the movie inside his own head. And I thought, if this is how Scott Pilgrim would like to live his life, doorbells would go ding dong and mm -hmm. phones would go bring. And like, I like the idea that he can see the black boxes. Mm -hmm. for, it, it, in his eyes, this is all really happening. You know? Yeah. And I love that, that he, he kind of comments on it. Yeah. And that makes it extra funny for the audience. Oh, no. I think it, without that joke of him, is it would be completely pointless. Yeah. Like, sort of, if he didn't actually say, yeah. how are you doing that? So, that hat gag always goes down well. Yeah. Okay. I'm very pleased with that. Here's, yeah. Here's Brie. Brie Larson. You left me for that cocky pretty boy. You haven't even seen him. Now, Envy is kind of like an amalgam. Well, em Emily Haynes was, was only like a drawing reference. Is that correct? Yeah, I had just seen sort of you know photos of uh, of Metric. Like I listened to the, their first album, and uh, and you know she's so theatrical in and in, in her costume and in her uh, kind of her moves on stage. But then also there was another kind of singer that we bizarrely have a really we we have a link to, the um, Amy Bowles from Pony de Look. Oh, that's right. <laughs> There's a, a, a Toronto band called Pony de Look who that's avant garde kind of almost like performance yeah, art. Yeah, the sort kind of, of performance art, art rock kind of group that, yeah, they were an inspiration for Clash of Demonhead. And it turns out to be Edgar's school friend. Yeah, I went to school with her. My brother went out with her. <laughs> and when me and Brian were walking around Toronto, she rode past us on a bike and said, Edgar? And I hadn't seen her in like 10 years. And so we got chatting and we, all got, you know, arranged to kind of catch up and get a drink. And as she rode off on her bicycle, Brian said, is that the singer from Pony to Look? And I said, yes, Amy Bowles. I went to school with her. And he goes, uh, she was, and he said, she's one of the girls that inspired Envy, which is just insane. Weird. Yeah. Now we should talk about this t-shirt here because this always gets a Sorry, massive it laugh. It gets a huge laugh, especially in Toronto, yeah. <laughs> it, get, it gets a huge laugh everywhere, Does to be it? honest. <laughs> like, now, uh, it, was, it was inspired by a comic, a uh, Japanese comic called uh, Tokyo Tribes that was about gangs. And one of the gangs was called Saru. And he had this um, Saru, like, what what do you call that? Like a like a collegiate vars oh, varsity a, shirt. Varsity shirt. Yeah. So I just turned it into SARS. Like that was a Toronto reference. SARS was a disease that ravaged the city in I think two thousand three. Yeah. All our shows are secret shows. That one gets that a big was a laugh. big laugh. <laughs> That's Alison Pill's biggest laugh in the film, which is great. <laughs> I love I love. We need groundswell. Mark Webber and Alison Pill and Johnny Simmons like are just like just the the finest ringers you could ever. That's ask another for. great little bit of score there. That's, oh, that little bit. So so beautiful. Well, you know that Nigel Nigel Godrich's dad used to work for the Radiophonic Workshop, who did all the music for Doctor Who, mm -hmm. and I feel like this is like finally Nigel has actually channeled 
like sort of uh, his. Finally, da- his dad approves of him. Yeah, or, or it just I feel I said to him, I said I feel like your dad is coming through your music finally. Um, you just reminded me of something. It's gone. Oh yeah, I, I always thought the Sex but Bomb kind of ringers and Vasty shirts, and I don't know if this was an influence, but it always used to remind me of what uh, G Force looked like in their normal garb. <laughs> I was a huge Getcha Man fan, yeah. like Battle of the Planets, and I always used to love the way that Mark and Jason and Princess looked in their kind of ringer tees and Vasta yeah. shirts. I think it just, when you're drawing a character in a t-shirt, just doing the little ringers makes it look a little classier. It's just, it's an easy way to make it look more like a shirt and less like just lines on a person. Hmm. So it's just, it just is sort of a neater way of doing, because you could do an outline. These ringers are easier to draw. Yeah. Or cooler to draw, rather. <laughs> I love this phone that seems like it's from 1982 or something. <laughs> that's what that's one. Then now that is product placement as well. No one. Right, that's the <laughs> that, one. That, that's that is the one bit of product Thank placement. Thank you, BlackBerry. Thanks, BlackBerry. Now tell us about Lee's Palace. Lee's Palace. It's uh, it's a real place. I've seen a lot of bands there. I don't. I can't name a single one right now. Did you ever play there? I did play there once, January 2005. With Imperial Otter or a different band? With. The band that Imperial Otter kind of mutated into it was called <laughs> Honey Deer. You sound like the Thamesman or something. Like you've got so many, like your spinal tap, you've got so many incarnations. That's just how the it, bands, the, the world of bands goes. Oh, I, I have a fun fact. Uh, the production design was so good at Lee's Palace that uh, one of the background players actually peed in the non-functioning That's right. <laughs> toilet. Oh, I love, there you are. There's Brian on the right. And Sweet. Hope. There's me. You just miss me. Um, yeah, so Lee's Palace is a real place, but this is obviously is a, a set that very much looks like the real place. Now, Johnny there, young Neil, is wearing his heart on his sleeve, would that be mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. And what's the idea with the four boxes? Uh, just the idea that it's a blank comic, I, I think. Oh, it's like he's like, a blank comic. It's like a little story that is his, nothing happens in this story. Yeah, the, young Neil is a, a series of he's, empty he's boxes. He's an unwritten story. Now this, um, Brandon is wearing the Punisher t-shirt, mm-hmm. which is ironic because Thomas Jane is about to crash into the film in about five <laughs> minutes time. But um, Brandon is wearing the Punisher t-shirt, which we got approval from Marvel for you to redo the logo. Yeah, so that's a Brian version. Lee O'Malley like, yeah. Punisher logo. Yeah. Uh, I, wish, I wish I had been able to draw it a little bit bigger, knowing, having known that Brandon Routh is like the size of God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's the description. <laughs> and here's here's uh, Envy Adams, full performance gear. Yeah, she's amazing in the scene. Yeah, this is like this is so much fun to shoot this stuff. Yeah, you guys shot the whole song, right? Yeah, it'll be elsewhere on this DVD that you have in your player right now. <laughs> but don't stop and watch it right now. Watch the rest of our commentary and then watch Black Sheep. Thanks for listening. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> um, now this was really fun to do all of this stuff, like, and I, I, you know, I think sort of, you know, the a lot of people ask about the split screens and the ratio changes, and really the idea with that is because like your drawings and in a lot of comics, panels are never always yeah, you don't like one eight five. Same thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what talk about like the way that you use negative space when you're drawing? Is it is, is inspired by you know? Is, you have Frank a great Miller. way, Frank Miller. I mean, <laughs> he was the king of nev- negative space. Yeah, that he be is. correct? No, he was a huge influence. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I find it really hard to talk about comics. Do um, it, especially this while a watching a film. Brian, this is your chance. <laughs> talk, talk about it now. Uh, well, I think my in, my innate <laughs> genius uh, leads me to to use a lot of black and white space in a black and white comic. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. Now this um now the Lee's Palace dressing room is not as big as this. Like, I'm not um, even I, I'm not even convinced they have a dressing they room. They kind of do. I I saw the one like on, a closet. Yeah, it's it's Oh, so there's a bunch of um if we're talking about threes, the the three in this scene is pretty obvious. But not just the three on Brandon's chest, but also the stripes on his arm as well. Yes. He's got three kind of r- ringer stripes. They're not ringers, are they? What are they called? They're I think they're just called sports stripes. Sports stripes, there you go. I'm going to stick to that one. <laughs> I'm going to say that's a technical term. I love all the flyers in the background. I oh, believe yeah. they're all for like local Toronto bands and things. Pretty much. There's some Cornelius ones in there as well. Oh, that's right. There's a bunch of artists that appear, like Kid Koala is on there. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of local bands, but also like, there's a three as well. There's another three there. That's one of my favorite shots. 
Well, him punching her out. Yeah, it's so good. And then the the way the hair dies, just it's turned back to liquid on the floor. I love yeah, it. <laughs> that's digital. Oh yeah, that wasn't really there. We that put that in later. <laughs> yeah, on the fridge as well. This is this line is what what sold us on Johnny. Yeah, jo Johnny Simmons did this line in his audition, the highlights line, and um, I think me and Michael Sarah watched it like sort of about ten times in a row because we thought it was so funny. <laughs> and I think sort of I contrived in the in the books he only says it once, doesn't he? Yeah, I contrived it was so funny. I thought sort of like you know he should say yeah. it twice. Say it again for emphasis. Oh, and also in terms of our number ranking, um, Michael is currently wearing a Zero t-shirt, Smashing Pumpkins. That's right, which is in the book. There's Tennessee Thomas Disappears right there. Yeah, I always notice that. Yeah. Now, do you think some fans of the books will probably be bummed that uh, Lynette doesn't break out her rabbit arm? I've seen a few uh, references to that, yeah. That's, that's the, only things that people, the only thing that people have mentioned to me that they missed, that they really missed, is that they're not enough Kim Pine, which uh, I readily accept and, you know, is that Alison Pill is amazing. And the other thing is that they missed the robots from the book robots, five. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I don't, you know what? I love the dragons. I love the dragons. I love that scene. But you know what I love in this scene is that we've got Brandon Routh playing what kind of looks like the terrible electric Superman from the 90s. Well, yeah, was how long did the electric Superman last? Six months, I don't know. Not very long. And he, he took over from real Superman for a bit. He was real Superman. His powers changed cosmically. But yeah, he had the glowing eyes with the smoke coming out. and Yeah, he looks a lot like... Uh, what, what were and was it like New powers. Recipe Coke where DC readers like reacted violently against mm -hmm. him? Yeah. yeah, as I recall. What, what now, were his new powers? Uh, lightning. <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> Do you think it was one of those sales ploys where they, they did it just so that when they brought back the original costume... It would have a huge spike I don't know. in sales. I, I feel like it was just misguided. Happens. I'm sure it. I'm sure it does. There was also a couple of threes on the alley there. Those trash cans had threes on them. Oh yeah, I remember that. Now here's another uh, another bit of your artwork coming up. Another um, animated flashback. But this this one is a. Uh, this I think was a a rough draft in the script for volume three that you guys ran with. Yeah. And I didn't end up using the whole thing. I only used the moon bit. Mm. Yeah, that's right. But the whole wrecking stuff, that was, I, I had written that, but these guys, someone drew this and made it look exactly like my work, which is great. It was great. Oscar and the guys from Voodoo Dog, this animation company in, the, in London, did this. Um, it looks great. They should draw uh, my next comic. Yeah. <laughs> they should, well, we should do an animated version of Scott Pilgrim like this. <laughs> Get those guys to do it. Um, now, the other, that's, that's interesting. One of the things that Brian just brought up is that we, like, after Volume 3, I feel, or maybe after Volume 2, we encouraged you to try and map out the arcs for the other, like, th yeah, four books or three books? Four, four books. You'd kind of half yeah. written three already. I, yeah. No, I think the time at the time it was I had only written one and two, so it was definitely like three and on. But three was but pretty three, much. Three, I right. had the idea from the beginning, like for that first first three book. And arc. would it be fair to say I've heard you say this that you you wrote the four, five, and six just to kind of um to to say to us that you were like sort of um basically. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I knew that I had Gideon. I knew that I had twins because that would make my life easier to make <laughs> one book. And I knew that I wanted one of them to be a girl. So there, the three of them already kind of existed. You didn't draw on them. As soon as I thought about it, I knew who they were. And then I just extrapolated from there. Now, here's an interesting question is that people who have said to me, like, um, occasionally when people say, the film's too long, why did it have to be seven X's? And I was saying, because seven sounds cool. <laughs> Six is even numbers are not we, cool. We Six talked is, about it. Yeah, yeah. Five was just not enough, and there's already five deadly venoms. There's five, I lots know. of fives. There's lots of too five many films, fives. Too many fives. Like so, we had to go for seven. So like, sort of, I want to give you value for money. Like sort of, I, I, yeah. you know. I love the lens flares and the kind of, uh, I don't know what you call it. Double exposure. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Coming up in this bit, can you see the mm -hmm. merch the, in the background? The fans and the with the cups. It's... Oh yeah, the practical effects with the cups. Yeah, well here you've got zero against three. Mm -hmm. I love these versus things. They really that one particularly. Yeah. What's always funny is that the versus sound is like the loudest thing in the film. It's yeah. like so ridiculously bassy. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, this is one of my favorite bits. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's really uh, what's what's really was it kind of nice about this in terms of expanding your. Your comics is the the points in the in the film where the music and the visual can take over for a little bit because, I mean, your 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 dialogue and sort of character work in the books is so amazing, uh, 
and I get I guess is the one thing that in the film that we can kind of take a little bit further is the visual and musical. Oh sequences. yeah, and you know having Brad Allen designing the fights and stuff. All those the the you know, the next fight after this, the Roxy fight, is it's so Jackie Chan esque. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it goes proper like this so. is my, one of my other favorite gags. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it doesn't get a laugh because it's too quick. It's like second time you'll Wait, see it. You know what? I I you know what? I I was really I I I remember drawing that shot. I don't know why that came up to me, that just the idea of him opening the door, I just thought it would be really silly. But what's funny about it is, um, I don't know if you can hear him open the other doors telekinetically before. <laughs> I've never heard it. If you, if you listen, if you go back and listen, you can hear the other two doors opening. So I figured, well, he's hovering there, he's going to have he's to open the other doors with his mind. Yeah. So it goes clink, 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 and then he comes through the third one. <laughs> That's great. Now, this is kind of an amalgam of, like, sort of partly stuff from Volume 3. But yeah. we, we had to come up with this... Um, well, you made him more active in the scene. He but it's still like... There's a funny line in your volume three about a deus ex machina. Yeah. And we kind of did the same thing with the soy. Yeah. And the vegan cops. And there's Thomas Jane. Thomas Jane. Five and a half and a half. Now, did you have any vegan friends? Did that come from any kind of uh, reality? Yeah. Were you ever vegan yourself? I was not vegan. I tried to be vegetarian for a while. It lasted about six months. And... Uh, my wife was vegan for a year or two. My friend Joel, who um, milk and eggs, bitch. the character Joel in Crashing the Boys was based on, it was uh, vegan for a few years too. Now you said you were for six months. What was your Achilles heel? What was what broke you? I I don't know. Meat. <laughs> <laughs> I love that go. this is green too. This is another Superman reference. Yeah, you know, it never really occurred to me until <laughs> Brandon brought it up. I thought, of course. Well, the thing is, that, is that it couldn't be any other color. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, vegans have to, it has to be green. It has to mm -hmm. be. So, you know, like, Superman is, Brandon is always defeated by the color green. Yeah. <laughs> that will happen in every film he ever does from now on. Yeah. Be gone. Be gone. That, I love that. And what I love is Michael's rubbing his head and the coke on his head after, like, this is, it's great. I never, I never thought of that stuff. Well, this was a really tricky bit in the script because, you know, unlike the books, which obviously are a lot more expansive, throughout the film structure wise in terms of like the kind of his labors of hercules and fighting the exes and jumping through hoops the the gaps in between the fights get shorter and shorter as the yeah film goes along. he doesn't get to reset no because it starts to become like a long especially this sequence we had to fashion this as like his long dark night of the soul like, yeah you know the todd fight and the roxy fight take place in the same night mm -hmm. so i i and i think sort of like and this is another bit where we had to kind of diverge off the books, but I always like this idea about with the Roxy sequence of being that party that you know you shouldn't go to, yeah, but you do, and it turns out to be as hellish as you imagine. Yeah, and there's this little exchange coming up in the Pizza Pizza, which originally I think there was a little bit more. There was uh, Wallace and other Scott had this little bit of dialogue. Oh that yeah, that would be on the a, DVD. Puts a finer point on it. But I, I remember, and I don't know if you've ever had this, I remember going to those, like, sort of um, highly sort of depressing kind of, um, you know, post-concert parties where the band wouldn't be there. Yeah, and there's Honest Ed. Oh, you missed it. It's come up again, I think. Maybe your memory's gone. I think, it's, I think that was the last time. Honest Ed, it's real. It's in, that, it's in this movie, that means it's a real place. Some people don't believe me that it's real. Oh, really? That's funny. Yeah, I, I, I like I like this idea of, you know, because I think what's great about your books is that they, especially in the later volumes, they become very bittersweet. And I think when we were writing, before you'd written volume six, I always felt like, and I know that you originally had an ending that was a lot more kind of bittersweet. It seemed to be going down that route. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of has a, like had an impact on the film in a way is that this section of the film is where Scott Pilgrim kind of doesn't want to play, play anymore. There was four. There was four. four. But I, I kind of like this idea that, like, at this point in the film, Scott Pilgrim has, is now trying to kind of, like, renege on his contract. Yeah, he's trying like, to get out of it. Yeah. yeah. Finally did. understanding the, the stakes involved. It's, it's too much work for him. And also, uh, hopefully, the idea that Ramona herself is, like, the kind of the, the quiet center to the storm is that she she is not kind of, like, it's not like she's a, 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 a bitch who is sort of, like, um, mm -hmm. broken. She's not a heartbreaker. I mean, is that based on sort of that? I, I mean, would you agree with that? I, I always, I always felt that Ramona was an interesting character because she's, she's caused a lot of heartbreak, but she's not a bad person herself. It's no, more but that I also are feel like the exes use her as an excuse to be yeah, evil, absolutely, um, which is another side of it. 
Well, I think that's the thing in the same way that, like, Scott Pilgrim kind of, like, uh, you know, the same way that in any relationship you kind of make an ex seem like a Bond villain in your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the whole idea of Envy Adams. Yeah. Is that, you know, and then all the other exes, I mean, they, they're these kind of this gallery of, you know, superheroes, supervillains, and uh, it's exactly what you don't want to think about your girlfriend uh, having been with before you, before you as Michael Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about the, uh, the, where did the idea of, like, her having kind of a, uh, a bisexual face come from? Uh, it came from cliche. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, cliche. That's a good crutch. Um, it's good, though. Yeah, no, and I, I enjoyed writing the character. Some... You know, obviously, she only gets one scene or one and a half scenes in this movie, but it's a... Uh... Mae Whitman is amazing. Yeah, she's incredible. And the costume... LJ, thank you. The costume, and now I think as well as the four on the nightclub, that uh, Roxy has four rips in her tights. That's right, and that versus was pink. Yeah, girl on girl. Exactly. And this is, as I said, this is one of my favorite. This is probably my favorite fight scene in the film. Just, it's so Jackie Chanish. All the little looks, the glances, and uh, it's it's so good. The um, well, what was great working with like Brad Allen and Peng Zhang. And them having worked with Jackie and being a huge Jackie fan is that a lot of um, a lot of fight scenes have gone the slow mo route, and I, I wanted this, these fight scenes to be really fast, like the mm-hmm. Hong Kong films that I used to watch when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And you know they're all like filmed at like twenty two frames per second, you know. But the great thing about it is like I mean we had an amazing stunt team, but Mary did that stunt like um, you know a lot of the actors are doing their stunts in a lot of places. But what's amazing working with that stunt team is that like. They, they literally have like an Olympic team on set. There's like, um, for each character, there's maybe three different stunt people with right. different special skills. Yeah. And sometimes it's a man, like sort of like Chris and Jar Jar, Chris Mark and, mm-hmm. and Jar Jar, like they're both like male stuntmen playing <laughs> the girls in places. And then sometimes you got like a, a girl who's just for the rhythmic gymnastics. Yeah. Just for the f- flipping that kind of belt up. This is a league game, meaning. Yeah, May Women's amazing. Yeah, she's so good. <laughs> well, you always had this idea. I remember when we were talking about the script, in terms of like Scott Pilgrim trying to come to terms with somebody's past, there's a level of immaturity in Scott because like... Oh, yeah. Because there's some 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 people out there, and I'm not speaking for myself, <laughs> some people would find the idea of a, a, a lesbian ex kind of, uh, kind of sexy. Well, yeah, you I, had I a sexy I guess I am sp- speaking for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would, you, would you agree on that? I'd have to. <laughs> well, well, you you guys wrote uh, Roxy before, or you wrote the the Roxy. bisexual jokes before I got to that part in the book. So I stole some dialogue back. Yeah, sexy. F- you sexy had a sexy phase. phase was one of you guys' lines. Well, I was, I'm ve- I was very. Um, I'm not going to take any credit away from you, but I was very pleased and proud when I saw that in the book. I thought that was that was that was very sweet. <laughs> but in the original draft that we had, and again, we were slightly spinning our wheels. Um, Waiting this for more books to Just for waiting for more books. And, <laughs> and with a couple of blessings in disguise, one being that I went off for two years and made Hot Fuzz, and the other being, not that the writer's strike was any kind of blessing, but the, the writer's strike, which lasted for nearly a year, nine yeah, months. A uh, long time. Long Too time. long. Too long. But that basically by the end of like the Hot Fuzz and the writer's strike, Brian had four books out and the fifth one written, I guess. But in the original draft of our script, we... Amalgamated, you amalgamated Envy Roxy and Roxy and Envy, together, yeah. which you know, and then as soon as book four was out, we changed it back mm-hmm. because we thought we have to have Roxy Richter in this film. Drink. Yeah. Special occasions. Why did you want? Four is, uh, book four was one very of my favorite. It was very helpful. The samurai, the lone wolf and cub. Uh, yeah, fight the, whole, at the, the ninja guy didn't thing. Yeah. I think book four is my. I think book four is my favorite actually. I think I think book four is my favorite too. There you go. <laughs> so if you're out there, don't buy books five and six. Not, it's not worth it. Or one, two, and three. Yeah, don't buy just one, two, straight and three. To four. Five and six. Just go straight for four. It's the only good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> now Mary here is is uh, now the chip on the head, which is something that came from your original notes. Is another thing that's not in the books, but that was one tiny from your very early 2005 kind of like trying to write out the arcs, which I remember right. you had this amazing series of like notes. I just remember seeing this uh, 
notepad with all these longhand notes that look like John Doe's book from Seven. <laughs> it was just like an amazingly packed kind of... And one of the details which you didn't end up using in the books was the idea of her having a chip in her head which Gideon controls her. Um, I, don't, I don't remember if I made that up or not. You did. You also had... There was a thing of... There, at one point there was a, a miniature Gideon inside Gideon. Yeah, that was just like... I was just like throwing stuff out there. That's good. You know, we stole some of it. I always like the idea of a miniature person riding a, a regular sized person. I know. I guess. I guess we probably couldn't have gotten away with that without looking Brian like a, drew a, that. a Team America reference. I did draw that. Oh yeah. In the art department. Same under face. duress. Tricky. You, be, <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff going on there. The four and a half there. Hey, right. Well, here's the idea: is that like Scott is wearing a four and a half T-shirt, and now that would seem to s jump out of the. That would seem to jump out of the theory: is why is Scott wearing a four and a half T-shirt? Because he's not one of the X's. But I'm thinking. This is the point where he's going towards the dark side. Mm. Yeah, he, this is, he's the fourth and a half X right now. Yeah, right now he has the potential. To, I mean, I and you, you deal with this in the books as well, the, the potential of that it could be so easy if... And why... One of the things we tried to do in the script when we reduced the timeline is take this idea of if Ramona changes her hair every week and a half, Scott Pilgrim could be gone in a week and a half. And if yeah. he is, like, he absolutely has the capability to become a jealous asshole and become one of the exes. Yeah. Mm. Would you agree, Brian Lee O'Malley? I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk about this scene. Yeah. Uh, this was, uh, this whole Amp versus Amp thing was in the um, original draft for Volume 5, which I sent you guys. And you used it. And I didn't. Yeah, you but how do you feel uh, about it now? I even wrote the sign with all the exclamation marks. I believe that, that's right. That's right. That's one. Of you, that's another one of your ones. <laughs> and then actually, no, that was also from my script. The whole uh, oh, with well, the exclamation marks thing. Yeah, yeah, and then saying that's impossible, and then actually, no, being the next title. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh, you my guys God. just See, ripped me even, right off. I can't even. Rem but that's what. <laughs> but that, I think that's what's kind of nice is I sort of sometimes. I can't even remember what's like yours and what's mine. Same here. Yeah, no, that's what I was saying. I, looking through volume one the other day, I was just like, I, I don't even know what I wrote anymore. <laughs> this, although I, I will say that I didn't do it because it would have been too hard to draw. Oh, really? <laughs> it's a Is pain in the ass. Would well, you remember in our <laughs> original draft? Who wants to draw a wall of amps? Was there a thing, and I can't remember whether it was our creation or not. Originally, there was an idea of the amps becoming robots. That was our I think that was your draft. idea. And then we didn't. We basically took out the robots because we felt, and in the original draft of the script, and even their storyboards for it, we had Gideon turning into a robot as the final boss, mm -hmm. which I think, again, was from one of your very, very early Yeah, Mecha, Mecha Gideon. Mecha Gideon. Maybe. We went from two robots to none. Yeah. But the, I, I think we took out the robots because we felt, after Iron Man and Transformers, that people would just think we were doing a spoof on, on those, which we right. didn't want. Plus Double Dragon. Yeah. Well, in the original, in the script, it was just one dragon, and then it occurred to us, oh, of course, it should be Double Dragon because they're twins. Yeah. And I did uh, and they a do lot of Double Dragon references. Sweet in, uh, hurricane kick. In and... the book, yeah. Now, there's a whole bunch of things going on here. The, um, the five and six here uh, are basically on their costume. There's like six bracelets on one of the twins, and the other one has five stripes on the starburst on his shirt, which is probably one of the kind of the... Most difficult numbers to spot. I'll grant you that. <laughs> I, I'd even, to be honest, I had to consult with the costume designer this morning because I had to <laughs> remind yourself. But there's a Japanese 11. Oh, That's and 11 right. is like six and five together. That's right. Whoop. There you go. See, I, I got out of that hole. Very I, I, love, I love how the scene uh, works. I love the snow. This was madness. I love, to I love watch. how determined they all look. I know this, this is probably the bit where we veer off from the books the most. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also we, we had to within the course of like a film we had to kind of make we wanted to sort of kind of make some of the fights musical you had the bass off in volume 3 yeah. but the idea of um, you know Sex Bob staying in the story longer to sort of chart their ascendancy through the music ranks yeah. and, and tie up with Gideon which is very different from the books but it was kind of our way of keeping the ensemble together a bit longer not that you don't in the books, but they've kind no, of split but, up. No, but in the books, yeah, the, the, the bands are not really about, um, you know, getting getting signed, getting a career. In the, in the books, they're just kind of, they're in a band for no apparent reason. Like, they, they're just in a band because it's fun. But I, I like in a way, hopefully, that it works, that the, the film is like a, an, a bizarro version of the books. Yeah, I, I like that. 
or, or even the idea of like those, you know, you remember those old choose your own adventure books? Yeah. The idea that mm-hmm. like, because We've Scott chose Pilgrim, different paths. Yeah, yeah, Scott turned left instead of right, and you end up with a completely <laughs> different film. Yeah. Yeah, I used to love those books. I used to make my own when I was a kid. I, mean, I used to. Cool. Who were those books by? Steve, somebody. No, uh, Edward Packard. Was the, uh, the oh, there were other ones as well in the UK. Oh, these those those uh, fighting fantasy, fantasy ones. ones. Yeah. yeah, fighting fantasy. I had a bunch of those too. Steve, mm, God. <laughs> Steve, if you're out we'll, there, we'll never know. Steve, send us a postcard. I used to love your books. <laughs> Me too. I would I would send you a fan letter, but I don't know what your surname is right now. <laughs> and you know, what? I'm not going to turn on my iPhone to check because it will just it'll just amount create a whole lot of buzz. Um, this was a scene that we wrote. Came to see your show. This came later, didn't it? Yeah, we wrote and unwrote this several That's times. That's right, yeah. I have yeah, this was in and out a lot. I'm glad it's in. I think Ellen Wong looks particularly particularly angelic in this scene. Yeah. Aww. And I love how they're both wearing hoods. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a choice of behooded ladies right there. <laughs> I mean, this is another thing. that the, the whole idea of the love... Str- the love triangle between like Ramona and Knives kind of came from um, your scene in volume two with the fight in the reference library mm-hmm. because I love that scene and it seems so kind of um, striking to me but there was no way of having that scene in the middle of the film as yeah. it was in the book so our biggest bizarro change is the idea of Knives coming back as like sort of her kind of um, ugly duckling turning into a like a badass swan yeah. that comes at the climax of the film instead of like in volume two badass swan <laughs> a badass, she turns into a badass swan. Speaking of swan, oh yeah, exactly. There you go. Wow, that was amazing. You just, you just hit. A, the Did I blow your mind? You just hit commentary gold again, Brian. That was an amazing link. Well, Swan. Um, swan is a character from Phantom of the Paradise, played by Paul Williams. Well, basically, there's two characters. This is, and this is where we like. It, it, you should talk about your original idea for Gideon, but I remember talking to Jason Schwartzman and, and you. I sent. I remember sending you Phantom of the Paradise and Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, yeah. because both of them feature like villainous Phil Spector types. Which, as soon as you read, and when we first talked about Gideon as a character, him being like a music impresario and producer, I just thought, and even the way he was drawn, I was just thinking he looks like an evil Phil Spector. Yeah, and it, it's weird, especially given. Phil Spector's criminal record now. <laughs> it's amazing how he has like inspired like two like great villainous portrayals in cinema. <laughs> and Swan from Phantom of the Paradise was definitely like um, an inspiration for me and Schwartzman. I uh, I hope Jason's other takes of this are in the some kind of blooper reel or something. His oh, whole Marcelo thing. Oh Marcelo, there's also one. Where, yeah, he says. Um, Watch your fingers, you'll be needing those later. <laughs> <laughs> Which is on the, that's on the DVD. There, yeah, there's got to be a lot of Jason on the DVD. There's also, if you look at the sevens, Gideon's G logo is made up of sevens. If you turn the, the, the Gs on their side, they turn into sevens. That's now, great. tell us about this t-shirt. It's from Rock Band, the but video this, game. This doesn't exist as a t-shirt though, does it? I don't think so. It do, well, it does now, I mean, but like... <laughs> I, uh, but you drew that in Volume 5? I drew it in Volume 5 because um, I had been, uh, I, as a musician hobbyist, I had been kind of like, what's what's the point of Rock Band? And then the guys who uh, create Rock Band at Harmonix, um, they read that. <laughs> they were like, we'll send you a free copy and see if you change your mind. And I completely changed my mind because I loved the game. It's so much fun. There you go. So I put it in the book as a little uh, respect to them. And then you put it in the film. So hopefully I- they sell a copy of Rock Band off this film. If I say what's the point of rock band, will they give me a free copy as well? Uh, maybe I don't know. Postage to the UK might be a little bit too much for them. Okay, <laughs> better then. Um, this was another scene that we inserted, sort of like just before shooting, because we felt like um, Stacy should kind of make a reappearance and be. She's she should like, actually be in a shot with Michael Sarah. <laughs> I know. Otherwise, yeah. Well, I guess they're in the rocket together. Oh, that's right. Yeah, but yeah, but um. It's funny, like Anna on the press tour at one point said that like a Stacey Pilgrim was like Jiminy Cricket, which made me laugh a lot. <laughs> yeah. Would I'd, that be true? I mean, your sister, is, is is she your moral compass? Would that be fair to say? I'd, at this age, she probably was, yeah. She she was, uh, she's a few years younger than me, but she was um, more mature, shall we say. Would she, would she, and she'd do the same thing and ring up and give you shit about stuff? Yeah, I think so. That, that, that would, that, that would fall in line with her personality. Does she give you shit about eating salmon? Yes, she does. She's a 
She's involved with saving the oceans now, so no one should eat any fish, I think. Oh, there you go. Moving with Ramona. Um She's with Gideon. And now this uh, this scene um probably just because he's better than This scene is partly based on the books. So it's kind of like some of the dialogue from I think volume, I five? volume 5. I think it's from volume 4. It's all over the place actually cuz the Coco thing is from volume 2. Spilling yeah. hot cocoa. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then the other parts are from volume four and f- four and five. I think it's four mostly. Did you, uh, there's oh, well, another deleted scene is the thing about the hero's journey, <laughs> which is on the DVD. <laughs> I still haven't seen that actually. Oh, you haven't? It's funny. <laughs> I don't want any hard it was JJ Abrams. The JJ saw, scene. Well, JJ Emerson saw the film and he when he saw the hero's journey, but he said he goes, he goes, I feel like that um that scene is written especially for me, and I said it is, and that's probably why general audiences are not going to get it, <laughs> and it was cut out. But it'll be on the DVD. It's it's very silly. Well, we had a thing sometimes, and you do the same thing in, in the books, is that you kind of break the fourth wall sometimes where you make reference to the fact it's a book. Yeah. And we, in a couple of times in the script, our way of dealing with, like, studio story notes would be to address them head on. <laughs> so, which, which kind a of... a character address the studio directly. Yeah, well, there was a line originally where he, uh, Scott Pilgrim, complained. He goes, you know, because people sort of sometimes, in, if people have a criticism of the film... Which is kind of goes for, you know, they could say the same thing about a lot of Asian films as well. Is that they're thinking, what are the rules? I don't understand the rules of the universe. And so we did have a line where Scott Pilgrim said, I just don't know what the rules are anymore. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> which which isn't in the film. But then he, do, he does have that line coming up soon where he says, that, I feel like I learned something. Yeah, that gets a huge laugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, was the Chaos Theatre, that's based on a game, right? Or part it's of the a, game? It's a reference to a... Yeah, to Earthbound, which is a very, very strangely popular um, little game that was on Super Nintendo in the late 90s. And it's, uh, yeah, it's there's this club called the Chaos Theater where the, the band, the Runaway Five, play. Now, were there any, like, super clubs or music clubs or venues that inspired it at all? Or is it kind of, is this completely fabricated? Well, <laughs> ah. uh, no, uh, actually... You and your production designer designed this club first, so I just ripped it right off. <laughs> but weren't but you, you, Brian, weren't you influenced by Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the movie? That's right, yeah. Oh. I, I did want uh, Gideon's Club. I got a little bit more of it in the comic, but oh. I wanted it to be more of like a... Hangout. Yeah, like in, if you've ever seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, uh, Shredder and his ninjas have this like bizarre club like with a skateboard ramp and arcade machines and all this amazing stuff that kids and nerds would love. I remember initially you were going to have a, a cold cereal bar, which oh, that's right. my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff is hard to draw. It was very weird, like, shooting in this club because it would really feel like a club but with those bonquettes and, like, little booths and stuff. Like, a lot yeah. of the crew would go and have a sleep. Yeah, we'd go hang out on the leather chairs and stuff. Self-included. Yeah. No use crying over spilled Coke, buddy. This was an amazing set. It's huge. Vast. Vast. Was vast. I was I was on this set a lot. Yeah, I don't I can't really see it as a real place though because I was there too much. I think. Yeah, this is the one set that I would say that about. This is funny. I uh, you know like um. Is that not clear? I kind of figured that Kill Bill style that I could get rid of the crowd like when the fight broke out. Um, kind of to save money, to be perfectly honest, mm-hmm. is that we couldn't afford to. Have, we couldn't, couldn't afford, afford to pay five hundred people every day. No, not for us, because this this yeah. this, this particular one fight went o- it when, when it went over schedule by ten days. It was very complicated, mostly because the pyramid was very complicated. But what's funny is that between shots, like the the, the crowd completely disappear, yeah. which kind of makes me laugh. It looks so ridiculous. Also, if you look in the background of this fight, you can see. Komu, played by Nelson Franklin, running to the elevator. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's in one of these shots. You can see him running for the door. I haven't noticed him in a while. Now, we, 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 uh, I'll show it's coming up. It's in the shot after this. I love this bit. <laughs> Michael does such a great job. There he, he is. There he goes. Amazing there he goes. job. <laughs> yeah, Michael's amazing here. Yeah. This one piece coming up after this is This ridiculous. is Chris, this I remember is Chris this Mark. Shot too, yeah. yeah, this was like 16 takes. This was a Brad Allen special. Yeah. I basically, that's, yeah. Right here. That's Michael. Yeah. That was that was about 13 takes, I think. Yeah. Um, and this song, I don't know if anyone notices, but it's, uh, it's an amped up version of the song from the intro of the film. That's right. Mm-hmm. I think actually back at first when when they um when they recorded that one I because I said to them can you do like a sort of uh you know a uh, 
cutting edge taste told FM radio version, like almost like the K rock version yeah. of the Sex Bomb thing. So it kind of really sounds kind of slick. And they did that jam. And I think Beck at first said, This can never be heard anywhere. Because <laughs> if you listen to the whole thing, it's not on the album, they start doing kind of like, it's actually really sweet to hear kind of like Beck and Co. doing like the sort of the most nudely like sort of um, mm. guitar wig out. <laughs> like it's really funny. Yeah, so this was our attempt to kind of like bring the the Toronto Reference Library fight into the climax yeah. and, and make the Love Triangle play out in a different way. Which I approve of. Well, what was it like? Here's a question. I mean, I know I kind of know your answer to this already, but we, we first wrote a draft in 2006, and I remember, and to be honest, to be perfectly frank, we kind of, because I was going off to do Hot Fuzz, we kind of did it as a placeholder because, you know, we knew it needed more work and we knew I wanted more books to be finished mm -hmm. but it was more of a thing to show it to the studio and say hey guys remember this we don't forget about it i still want to make this film but how did it feel reading our first draft in 2006 <laughs> did it be honest um it felt terrible <laughs> we, knew, I, we knew it did because you were no, so I nice i was so nice about it yeah <laughs> um no i mean i you know i i knew it was something that you guys had kind of banged out and you know and as it went on it kind of it had less less uh, <laughs> effort put into it I think towards the end uh, which is like completely understandable it was a first draft you know I know it was I, m I remember kind of like sort of I remember emailing you you'd already I sent you an email to kind of forewarn you that we'd we'd finished something to hand into the studio yeah. like and, and it's always that thing I always call it like the kitchen sink draft the first one and we just kind of threw in everything and sometimes you just put in jokes to make kind of like the development people laugh that are not going to make the finished thing you know and in fact a lot a lot of lines like sort of pretty much there were a lot more pop culture references mm -hmm. that we threw in and yeah. then took them all out um one of them there was even a joke about superman returns um at one point and and we cut it out not because a, we, we thought it was something that was better but also thinking i can't make fun of a film that brandon's in when brandon's in the film <laughs> Um, now, talk about the Dream Desert. Where did this inspiration come from? To be honest, I have no idea. I have no idea. Did it come to you in a dream? Maybe. Uh, I, I don't know. There's a lot of dreams in the first book, Scott Pilgrim. Yeah, and it's... Uh, I don't know why. It's like, it seems like a narrative crutch, but um, it was a good way to, to uh, kind of get into, the, into his head Like when there, there's no narration, there's no kind of inner world other than that's what's externalized in the visuals and the fights and stuff. So this was, in the first book, obviously, there's not as much craziness, so the dreams are kind of a shortcut to that, I guess. Yeah, yeah. This is my, I was trying to do a full-on Naruto here. Yeah, there's so many layers. Yeah. And Jason's kind of having a conversation with someone off screen. Yeah. I, I, there was, I think he was doing, there was no sound recorded there, but he was definitely talking to, he's like he's talking to somebody at a party. Yeah. <laughs> Someone cooler than a Ramona. Yeah. That's the idea, I guess. He's blanking Ramona. I really will leave you alone forever now. Now, um, yeah, the chip idea, I definitely remember was from one of your very early, early, early kind of like sort of outlines. But something that, you know, and we kind of used the chip as a way of like, it's like, um, Ramona's restraining bolt. It's kind of like holding her back in the final mm -hmm. fight and the idea that Gideon can literally control her mind. Cause I, I, but it was your, your you know, thing that came through volume six and I remember when we were writing the final draft, the idea that like, um, the switch around being that it was the one time that she was kind of like obsessed with him. Right. It, you know, that was that was a kind of a, a, yeah. a really good Yeah, I wrote kind some of, of the lines in this scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 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 what happened. Just before we started shooting, I, th I remember sitting in our apartment in Toronto and the three of us going through the script, but then also you rewrote the Dream Desert scene or you did a pass on it. Yeah, I wrote some of the lines in it, yeah. You know, and then we reshot a little bit of it. Like, yeah. Yeah, we did sort of some of the reshoots. So, um, so essentially you should have been paid for that, but you know you're not going to get anything, <laughs> right? Really? <laughs> That's the first time hearing of it. <laughs> oh, he's back in. Uh, yeah, he's we, back we in just, the room. We just missed uh, a whole bunch of stuff. We just missed. Uh, yeah, you, the comic book is better than the movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I I did that. That was never in the script, was it? 
I don't think we ever wrote that in the script. No, I don't think so. But I had it as improvisation, but you were on set the day that Nelson Franklin said that. I remember that. <laughs> you were sitting by the monitors when he did that. Yeah. So was that the first time you heard that line? Uh, probably. <laughs> That's good, though. It's like, uh, it's preemptive, uh, you know, you're critic proof now. Yeah. I did that as a preemptive strike against the fanboys. Like, <laughs> I said it before you, therefore I win. <laughs> Take that adaptation, people. Um... Now, yes, you in the final book, like I um, when I was editing, like is when you were still drawing book six, and we had some, we had another scene that came between the Dream Desert and his extra life. He went back to Wallace's and did the do over thing. Right, it was quite a bit longer. It was a little bit longer, and then when I read volume six and I saw how quickly you got back into the chaos theater, mm -hmm. that inspired me to kind of cut that bit out and get straight back into chaos. Yeah, it feels good now. Yeah, although I do, I mean, my, one of my favorite bits is him telling John Patrick Amadori that his hair looks stupid and him exploding, so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that's still in there. That's still in, yeah. If you look back at that, you actually, if you freeze frame that bit, when he explodes into a coin, his lollipop is hanging in the air and drops down. <laughs> it's proper Looney Tunes gag. Very good. I love that line. Steal my boyfriend, taste my steel. Hmm. I like it. I like the sort of, a lot of the effects in this sequence like really remind me of like old 80s films and stuff. Yeah. Like the fire and, do you know, it's got like this hand-drawn quality. We kind of wanted a lot of the, like the dragons and stuff, but even like the, the sword effects, it kind of feels a little bit more like Ghostbusters than like sort yeah. of, than contemporary films, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Never felt better. Yoo-hoo! I love the smoking arm too. What, what, is, what is the deal with that? Is he made of fire? Is he Satan? Well, he um, because he's been chopped by the flaming sword. We figured his, oh, his suit would be on fire. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That was a, that's digital smoke. That, yeah. In some of the earlier bits, it's real. Yeah. Now this bit, Hobbit came up because um, we did originally have this robot sequence that's with right. Mecha Gideon, uh, which I'm very glad we got rid of because I think this is my favorite bit of action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this whole keeping section. it on a personal level, I think, is good. Yeah, and it's it's pretty true to kind of like games in terms of that you have to defeat the final boss twice. Yeah, and then the pixel sword is is brilliant. I, I remember I gave Oscar a note on it because uh, it wasn't quite working, and I was like, you have to keep the pixels straight. He was rotating the pixels oh. in early versions, and it just didn't really look like pixels. It just looked like a mess. Was that that ref that that little um, video that Oscar did with the stunt man? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was with Jar Jar, right? Yeah, and he was just working on it. He was trying different things, and it wasn't quite working. And that was the one note I gave to Oscar. That's one of the things I got to say about this whole experience is that it felt like such a cooperative effort because you had like myself and stunt guys and animators working hand in hand. Yeah. And like you know, Brad Allen and Peng are like as big a geeks as the rest of us. <laughs> like Brad Allen. Well, they like who's... shot the whole film, like their own version of it. Didn't I know they? there's this kind of Sweden like stunt version of the film, which yeah. kind of looks like some mm. bizarre it's kind of like insane. Asian pirates. Which yeah. You'll, you'll see some of them. A on actors the... change from scene to scene. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. It's so it's so funny to watch. Because ba basically, any you know, a lot of their R and D and research and fight tapes would kind of like get. Wait, if you thought the fights were long now, <laughs> like yeah. um, all of their versions were like ten minute long fights, <laughs> which are amazing. And like yeah. in, a, in a different universe, I would I would absolutely pay There'd to be see that. A three hour film. A yeah. three hour film of just kind of endless fights. This um I like this shot here. This changed a bunch of times actually yeah. with the line this that he is, says. Yeah, the line here was uh What? One of one of my favorite Jason lines I got cut. Was, uh, Are you guys, yeah. mad, you guys at me? mad at me? <laughs> but it, it felt like he was he was too nice. Though. Yeah, it was too. It, it was. It made it feel much a lot better him to say a cocky what. Yeah, I love this bit here. The animation in this is extraordinary. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And this was the idea of them, um, Scott and Knives playing out their ninja ninja like routine at the end was was always there. Mm -hmm. But the idea of actually putting the graphics in yeah. didn't come until. And I like saying that the two player mode thing was. That's a good master stroke there. Oh, thank you. Well, you know what I really like there? If you listen to the sound, the sound effects on that two-player mode gets me every time. It goes, beep, 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 beep. It goes up in, it's like goes up in pitch. Yeah, it's great. It gets anyone going. Now, this is reshoot. Yeah, this bit here was a, was a reshoot. We came back a year later, and we changed some bits of this, including the ending. And Jason, uh, uh, Gideon had, like, a speech in the original version, but it wasn't... He didn't really show teeth enough. He kind of wasn't like, <laughs> he wasn't properly booable. Yeah. And so the idea was, and also you had this funny line in volume six about him being drunk on, on Craigslist. Craigslist. 
And uh, I didn't want to put Craigslist in because it means nothing outside North America. Yeah, I feel I, I I'm uh, slightly regret using that particular word. So the idea of like the contact information guy came in. Yeah. And finally, at a test screening, on our fifth test screening, with that new monologue, finally people clapped when he got his head kicked off. Mm. Thinking, oh, good. And it was like my note to Jason was like, sort of like, we have to hate you. You're far, <laughs> far too likable to be a baddie. <laughs> He's kind of the most likable like baddie. Yeah. I love this piece of music by Nigel Godrej. This is so beautiful. It's it's amazing. The whole score, like I listened to the score isolated for the first time the other day, and it's just like it's it's so brilliant. Yeah, it's beautiful. so many little Nigel Godrej flourishes in it. This this one's amazing. I love it. It sounds like kind of Nigel should be like, I don't know, making like Apple Apple startup chimes and stuff <laughs> like in the future. Take over from Brian Eno doing all of that kind of stuff. Did Johnny just eat a coin? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of figured that was my note to Johnny. I kind of figured that young Neil might think that coins were chocolate. <laughs> he is at the check. Yeah, he had to check. He had to eat one. <laughs> How does it feel to see so much Canadian currency on screen? It's good. It feels like this, this movie was very expensive. <laughs> did you return all that currency after? Or did you spend it? Mark Webber stole some of it. <laughs> well, he, he said good. on his other that's commentary, appropriate. he stole about $30 worth of loonies and toonies. <laughs> <laughs> now, Negascott was in... Now, I remember us sitting in Toronto, and I remember you telling us about Negascott and how that was going to play out in Volume 6. And I remember the three of us sitting up together... And maybe in the Soho Metropolitan in Toronto, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember us coming up with this gag in the room together. Yeah. I definitely remember that saying about what if they really got on. Yeah. That well, was... I think it's a great gag. Yeah. It's like in, in, the, in Volume 6, they actually have a proper scrap. But I yeah. mean, one of the reasons this gets such a big laugh is I think people are relieved there's not another fight. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, no, Edgar Wright's doing it again. <laughs> another climax. Didn't he learn his lesson from Hot Foes? Yeah. <laughs> Too many climaxes. Yeah, it's totally a relief laugh. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the, this changed ending because the um, the original ending of the film was that he went off with knives and that Ramona kind of like um, disappears to, I mean, disappears to Prague. <laughs> Very specifically, he goes yeah. to Prague. Now, you know, and, th and this kind of, I think when we first wrote the first draft, you hadn't written volume six, but I remember one of your, and one of the reasons that came about is I think maybe... Me and Michael felt a lot of sympathy for Knives, mm -hmm. and I think maybe that's because Volume Two had just been out, and yeah, I two think and the three, sort of, yeah, yeah and, the, and I think the dumping scene in like sort of Volume Two is yeah. it felt like something that like yeah, uh, like that poor girl broke our hearts. Yeah. Well, we also had this idea. This is very strange, but we talked a lot about Pretty in Pink and the fact that like many people decry the fact that she goes off with Andrew McCarthy and not John Cryer. Mm -hmm. And so this was our attempt to kind of like um, reverse Pretty in Pink. And then, uh, ironically, exactly like the original Pretty in Pink, where apparently they shot an ending with John Cryer, um, which I think is true. Uh, somebody tell me that. It might not be true, but um, don't quote me on that. But the idea is that now we, we actually went back the other way and we did the right thing. But it also because as soon as I read Volume 6 and how y you kind of made a change. When you wrote Volume 6, you... At some point, you left it kind of open-ended so that you could see how you felt when you yeah, wrote the final volume, exactly, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. When I started volume six, I wasn't quite sure, but then I just felt like it was... Everything was pointing this way, and uh, and he's you know he's fighting for her all along. That's the line that I gave to Knives. And, yeah. uh, and it just it just felt right. It felt, it felt like a cheat to do anything else, really. Well, it was interesting because we test-screened it with the Knives ending four times. And some people really liked the Knives ending. And in fact, some, some people who, and interestingly, usually older people were even like sort of like angry that we changed it. And I sort of said, well, you should read the final book because... But I think one of the other things that's interesting about it was it felt like it disempowered Knives. Mm. That like, it felt like a... And as soon as I spoke to Ellen Wong about it, after... Basically, we, we kind of, um, I, you know, decided to sort of change the ending. And then before going back to the studio and saying, can we reshoot the ending, me, Michael, and Brian got together. Actually, we didn't even do it together. We did it all by email, right? Yeah, it was just like yeah. passing Ton it around. Tons of emails back and forth. Yeah. yeah, we wrote this scene. We had a part. It was like sort of, you do a pass, you do a pass, you do a pass. It kept going around and around. And um, you know what? Actually, J.J. Abrahams even read it because like, he'd seen the sort of Knives ending. And I remember sending it to him, and he thought it was really great. But you, But Brian wrote the line that, like... It got a round of applause from like the audience at Comic Con. I was really pleased with the line of Knife saying, 
I'm too cool for you anyway. Mm. Which is such a great wrap up for her character. Yeah. And uh, well, in the earlier version, there was a line where I think Scott said, "I'm cool enough for knives" or something. There was just some some variation on that. So I was like, kind of trying to give that back to knives. Yeah, it's it it's very sort of. I think it's sort of. It's definitely because at one point I remember your very early volume six notes, you had sort of like potentially had like a more bittersweet ending where Scott ends up with nobody. Yeah, where Scott kind of goes off on his own, having and, hopefully learned something. Yeah, I know. I always, I always kind of figured that that was an ending that maybe the studio wouldn't go for. Uh-huh. And so I remember we wrote the Knives ending as being a sweet kind of cyclical thing. But it always seemed like, even though I like elements of it, the dialogue that we wrote in the original ending never quite worked as well as it should have. And, you know, at the, at the test screenings, some people quite rightly, exactly what you said, felt cheated. They just watched yeah, Michael well, Cera be beaten like, up for 110 minutes. Yeah, I mean, and plus he, he goes right back where he started in that version, which is like... He learns something, but he just, you know, he, he doesn't really go anywhere. And then Knives doesn't really go anywhere. And then Ramona kind of just disappears and, and she never gets resolved. So I, I felt like that was a cheat for everyone. Well, I think hopefully what works nicely about this ending is that, and it's interesting seeing people's interpretations of it. It's one of the things that I think when we wrote this new ending, that's similar to, to, to the ending of the books, but the idea is that Scott Pilgrim is going to leave Toronto that he's making another, you've basically reset the film back to the first date. And is like, is Scott with everything he's learned gonna take another leap into the unknown? And yes, he is. And maybe Scott and Ramona aren't, have already split up by the end of the credit roll, which is very long, <laughs> frankly. Um, you know, or, or is this the start of a beautiful relationship or is this just like their second first date? You know, they- Yeah, maybe it's just a time warp and they'll end up back at her apartment. <laughs> I know, that's what I kind of think is that that door like could mean anything and it could mean that they go back to the apartment and make yeah. out again and maybe he chooses a different tea the second time around <laughs> he, he knows what the teas li- are liver, liver disaster yeah she says sort of like what kind of tea do you want he said oh i'll have sleepy time yeah he knows there's more than one tea now yeah and he gets times two bonus for everything he learned something but that's a beautiful thing at the end of your books is like the idea and and what really resonated with me with the end of volume six is the and what really resonates for me with the character, because I've been through this and where I can find a lot of personal connection to Scott is the idea, you know, in terms of wish fulfillment, like aside from the fighting and like being like a kick-ass fighter, the idea of like how many times in a relationship or, or anything in life if you're thinking, I'd love to do that all over again and I'd make better yeah. choices. Yeah. And I think that's, in terms of it being a positive gaming thing is that that would be, a lot of us would like to kind of like do over and do things like better the second time round. Yeah. That's that's a wish fulfillment for sure. Michael Bacall, would you like to add anything to that before this film ends? Mars. <laughs> <laughs> that was really like sort of surreal. That was uh, very deep. That was very deep. <laughs> Here he comes, Scott Pilgrim. Paul Robertson. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for listening, guys. There goes Scott Pilgrim. Goodbye. The end. <laughs>